It is three minutes after ten, and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Where I, I don't know if you how much you've been listening this week. I was looking back at the late Terry Wogan's words about radio a couple of days ago. Um, a former colleague of mine shared them on social media, and it, it, it did remind me that the chances are that you're only half listening to me at the best of times. There's sort of a little bit... Of, my middle name could be background noise. There's the, the relationship you have with the radio, we sometimes forget, is quite casual. In my mind's eye, I see you sitting there, wait, wait, counting the pips, waiting for the show to start at 10 o'clock, pressing hold on your life for the next three hours and hanging upon my every syllable. That's in my mind's eye. In reality, of course, you're probably not... You probably think my name's Brian. Uh, some callers still do. I've been here 20 years. Morning, Brian. Morning. So that, that lovely quote. So I, I may play it to you one day if you're very good. Uh, on, on Terry, uh, the late, great Terry Wogan um, reflected upon this, this, this strange relationship that we have. But if you were listening earlier this week, and either, either of the last two days, you'd have heard me talk a little about anxiety uh, in, in quite strange contexts, actually. We talked about anxiety in the context of public school swagger or, or self-confidence, self-belief, as it's probably more helpfully termed, during our conversation yesterday about fee-paying schools and the notion of that swan. I didn't use this figure of speech, but it's a helpful one. The swan that serenely glides down the down the waterway whereas beneath the surface its feet are pounding away like the clappers and that that's how anxiety often appears to me you can uh, uh sort of um uh, appear to be serene or even confident whereas inside your heart rate is is racing and and you are uh, t- to some degree crippled perhaps by self-doubt mentally mentally stymied by it and I, and I told you that in my early days as a, as a gossip columnist when I had to uh, go up to famous people and try to get them to talk to me I, I was so crippled by nerves I absolutely riven with anxiety and nerves that I'd frequently be physically sick forgive me uh, for dropping that on you at five minutes after 10 in the morning frequently be physically sick and uh, and yet from the outside, you'd have thought that I was very much to the manner born. I, and and, and I, I found myself thinking about that today when I started reading about the surge in young people being hit by what, what is being called the equivalent of a midlife crisis. If, if you want to be sort of chronologically correct, then we might call it a, a quarter life crisis. But young people are becoming less happy than older generations as they suffer. Uh, America's top doctor has warned that young people are really, really struggling. He has suggested that um, allowing children to use social media was like giving them medicine that had not been proven to be safe. And he even described the failure of governments across the world to better regulate social media in recent years as insane. Um, I think we need to have a bit of a stop and think at this point because I've always filed it under uh, moral panic, this talk about social media. I I always remember an old, my first ever producer was adamant, his fury, his fury about the criticism of young people for playing video games instead of playing out in the garden was visceral. And the reason for his fury was that he wasn't, we used to say at my boarding school, not very good at games. He wasn't very good at games. He wasn't what you would call a physical specimen. And yet when he was playing FIFA on the PlayStation, he could do things that would make Wayne Rooney goggle in admiration. And so to suggest to him that you'd be better off outside playing football instead of inside playing video games was, was, uh, was palpably absurd. And the same, in a way, applied to war games. Certainly in the last 10 years, uh, you know, I fondly remember running through the woods with my friends, uh, wielding sticks that we pretended were M16s and, and, and pretending to shoot each other and all sorts of enemies were, were slayed. But if you then had a little look at Call of Duty or Halo, or or, or one of the really sort of of top-of-the-rank first-person shooter games, you'd be tempted never to leave the house again. Never mind go out and start playing soldiers with your friends on Clapham Common. Uh, And similarly, then the the, the immersive nature of games like Grand Theft Auto and the rest um, uh, plays into this narrative as well. So I've always dismissed it a bit, this fear of social media. I think I've been very lucky touch wood with my children who haven't 
uh, fallen under its spell completely, but I've certainly got friends whose children have. Lego's been a great saver in our house, actually. Would you believe that? that Lego is a great way of doing what what, um, psychologists call free play or just doing something that takes you away from screens. But I've always had it down as... um, I've always had it down as moral panic territory. Somewhere in the back of my mind, I've always thought, oh, come off it. it video didn't kill the radio star. Uh, yeah, video games haven't raised a generation of psychopaths and sociopaths. The, the, the idea that every generation has a sort of technological development that older people think could signal the end of civilization as we know it. Do you, you see what I mean? I just thought that talking about social media, talking about smartphones, would in 10, 20 years' time sound a little bit like conversations surrounding or, or uh, Daily Mail editorials about Grand Theft Auto. The world turns. The world turns. I always think of cars and blacksmiths at this point as well, when there's absolute fury about the motor trade starting up, about cars um, becoming commonplace, because it was going to put all the blacksmiths out of business. But guess what? The blacksmiths dealt with it. They moved on. They did something else. So that's been my position, both as a parent and as a presenter of the radio programme that you are currently listening to, wherein we occasionally, I suppose, slip into the clothes of the social commentator, don't we? We talk about things that are happening around us. We talk about whether they're good, whether they're bad. We encourage people or help each other to understand things. And we and we generally, generally come down, I think, I hope, on the side of the angels. Uh, we will not, for example, today be dedicating much of the programme to complaints about prayers on a railway uh, notice board. <laughs> um, uh, down with prayers is, is I think, well, today's policy, depending, of course, upon the uh, identity of the of the prayer. So we generally, generally come down on the right side of stuff. But I've got a feeling we might have come down on the wrong side of this. The Surgeon General, the US Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy, talking about 12 years in which people aged 15 to 24 were measured as being happier than older generations, seems to have flipped in 2017. Um, that's in America. In Western Europe, it, it, it's narrowed, and it looks like we are knocking at the door of something similar. He describes it as a red flag that young people are really struggling in the US and now increasingly around the world. And I want you to tell me whether you agree, because look, this is the US Surgeon General. It doesn't mean that he's 100% guaranteed to be correct, but it does mean that we should probably pay some attention to him. It's a story that we didn't get around to discussing a couple of weeks ago, and I only remember because I'm such a messy, I'm such a scruff bag that sometimes I, 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 I sit down after the show and find stuff from about two weeks ago that I've forgotten to throw away. And there was an article I'd cut out of the newspapers talking about how current generations of young people are less... They they think they're going to be less happy and less successful than their own parents. And that's a significant moment for a society. I think all you have to think about is home ownership to realise where a lot of this is coming from. And you are probably not going to be as well off as your parents were. You, You will look at their relationship, their economic situation... And you will see something that you increasingly believe might be beyond your reach. So, so that must be part of this story as well. Um, he has described it, Vivek Murthy, as driving on roads with no speed limit. He talked about touring the country's university campuses last year and finding so many youngsters plugged into earphones and gazing into laptops and phones that the communal areas were incredibly quiet. Where, he wondered, was the loud chatter from his college days. Students would say to him, how are we supposed to start a conversation? They don't know how to to do it anymore. So, hand on heart, hand on heart, how serious is it? How serious is it? Uh, it's a mad question, this, really, because we've asked it a million times in the past, but always from the other side of the, f- of the room, always from the, oh, don't, let's not get carried away. Is it possible that technology, the combination of technology and social media, is it possible that things are actually a lot more serious than we have allowed ourselves to believe. And you'll be able to answer this question in one of two or three ways. You you will either be simply observing, because none of us can be 19 twice. None of us can compare 
what what it's like to be 19 now with what it was like to be 19 when we were 19. We can't do it. You might have a 19-year-old. You might think that you therefore have insights into what it's like to be 19. But we can never know for sure. We can never inhabit it. We can. That's why time travel fascinates us so enduringly, isn't it? That idea you can you can never inhabit two time zones. It, it, even if you're alive, it's a different place when you're 52 from what it's like when you're 19. So no one is going to be supremely qualified to comment on this phenomenon. Nobody is going to be able to say, I have been 19 in 1991 and I have been 19 in 2024 and here are the differences. Here are the differences. Quite a few of you already, and I think he may have been on a different radio programme this morning, uh, cite, citing a writer called Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T, I think, or or H A H. Oh, anyway, hey, he's got a vowel in it, two vowels, and then D T on the end. Whether it's A I or E I, I can't quite remember. He writes very, very powerfully about this, but he also sounds a, a, a very loud warning bell that we are, as societies, marching, arguably with our eyes closed. We're marching our young people off a cliff of loneliness, anxiety, and unhappiness, and the big, big culprit the biggest culprit by a country mile is the smartphone it doesn't mean it's true but it means we need to talk about it what do you think oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three is the number that you need this is falling well-being scores that are are contradicting the well-established notion that kids start out happier and then sort of sink into a U-curve, have a midlife crisis and then pick up again. British people under 30 are now 32nd in the rankings behind Moldova, Kosovo and even El Salvador, which are, you know, statistically places that should be considerably less happy than here, given things like, for example, the murder rate. So everyone can contribute to this conversation. Everybody can, can look at the society in which we live and just wonder about the damage that social media has done and is doing, particularly to this cohort of 15 to 24-year-olds. Um, I want you to talk to me about it. I want you to tell me to chill out and uh, just because some fancy American doctor is having kittens about it doesn't mean that we should. I want you to tell me to be on even more vigilant guard because you know for a fact that this is the reason why young people are reporting considerably lower levels of basic happiness than ever before. I want you to tell me what has happened to you, how you know that this is either true or false. But, um, but I, want to, I, want to, I want to knit it all together if we can, okay? The number you need, 03456060973. Hit those numbers now, you will get through. And, and just bear in the back of your mind that very obvious, but I think pertinent observation, is that none of us can ever be 19 twice. So you don't know what it's like to be 19 now, and they don't know what it was like to be 19 then. How, therefore, can we measure how much has changed? Answer, I don't know, but let's try. 20 minutes after 10 is the time. I tell you when I first heard the alarm bell. I, I first heard it in 2018 and I ignored it. And I think increasingly I was wrong to do so. And what I heard in 2018 was a, a, a report that was even old by then, but I hadn't, I hadn't noticed it at the time. And it was about Steve Jobs, the co-founder of Apple, the late co-founder of Apple, who in about 2011 revealed in an interview that he didn't let his children use the iPad that he'd invented or that his company had invented. He talked about limiting how much technology his kids could use at home, and he was the co-founder of Apple. And then I found out that Bill Gates had time limits set on how much screen time his children could uh, enjoy. The mobile phones were banned at his dinner table. Mark Zuckerberg wrote a letter to his daughter that, that came out in 2017 uh, urging her to stop and smell the flowers in life. It made no mention whatsoever of Facebook or indeed of the internet. And The Telegraph published an article in 2018, which I've just dug out, because this was the first time I really noticed it, w listing all the Silicon Valley head honchos who didn't let their own children anywhere near the technology that their fortunes had been in large part built upon. Um, built upon the popularity with our children. It's crazy, right? Logan's in Bath to kick things off. Logan, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Oh, um, I just, I just like to say that I'm, I'm 20, so I'm kind of in that middle generation of, I've also, I've been brought up without a phone, and yes. then I've also been part of the generation that's grown up with a phone. 
Um, and I do think it's it's really damaging. I I wouldn't say mi- midlife crisis, but um, in it's terms of in the, terms the of equivalent of, of the I, sh- I mean, it's an unhelpful phrase, isn't it? Because you're only twenty, so. But but it, the equivalent of a midlife crisis, in the sense that that the gradient of happiness is supposed to be at its highest when you're young, and then it dips at, at, at around forty f- to fifty. That's the traditional midlife crisis, and then it actually starts going back up again. So the reason why they've used that terminology is simply to describe the fact that your generation is dipping much earlier, much much earlier. I I kind of understand that because when I think midlife crisis, when forty, you kind of you, maybe you see your friends and some people. I guess done better than you yeah. in their career or financially, and I think that's maybe what they're on about. Because with things like TikTok and Instagram, is you're constantly being shoved things that, like they say, the algorithms, which they can't help but other people's lives. The very small percent of people who are having great lives, but you're also seeing that greatness. Maybe once someone's had one good day, but you're seeing that in the rest of the um, their bad days. And I do think that that is quite damaging for young people because they don't really have the the life experience to know that that's not what it's like all the time. I, I, I guess it's always, I mean, the, the figure of speech that you're describing is as old as the hills, though. The grass is greener on the other side. It always, it always looks like people are having more fun than you are when you look over to the other side of the riverbank. So, again, there's nothing new under the sun. And yet there, there, there seems, it feels increasingly as if, there is, as if there is something new about this. Guess what the happiest countries in the world are? Oh, I don't know. Go on, have a guess. New Zealand? No, I can see why you've said that. It looks lovely, doesn't it? Finland. Finland always comes top on these sort of things. Finland, Denmark and Iceland are the three happiest countries in the world. So what relationship do Finnish, Danish and Icelandic young people have with their smartphones and social media? Well, they, they are, I would say, on paper, they're kind of more well-off countries. Maybe they've got a bit more... Um... And they've got much higher public spending, much higher taxation and much higher public spending. So the, 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 the gap, the wealth gap is much smaller. But that's got nothing to do with, with social media. I, I, well, that's the first answer to the question, isn't it? Is that you, you are growing up in a world where it seems as if you're missing out. FOMO was yeah. invented for your generation. And, that, and that, that adds to anxiety in a way that people like me can't understand because I haven't been 20 for 32 years. But I, what I can do, which is probably not helpful, is say, well, when I was 20, I was jealous of people who were getting into the VIP section at Ministry of Sound. Actually, I wasn't. Um, but if I wasn't getting into the Ministry of Sound VIP section, I would have been jealous. Uh, maybe there were VIP sections I couldn't get into. and I was, So there's always something that you can point at and say, well, I didn't get any of that sweet, sweet uh, happiness, but but the social media is in your pocket and it's whispering in your ear all the time about this. Uh, Twenty four minutes after ten is the time. It's not confined to young people. That the social media relationship could easily have had a negative effect, a deleterious effect on older people. But it, as a social change, it's the relationship between overall well being and age that seems to be undergoing a relatively profound transformation. Uh, Collins in Croydon. Colin, what would you like to say? Yeah, it's really about my daughter. Um, uh, she's 22. Um, the level of anxiety that she has, she's recently been diagnosed as being, you know, ADHD, having ADHD. Okay. And what I'm, I, I'm, I'm concerned about her prospects. I'm a homeowner uh, yeah. and I've worked hard all my life. And, you know, I, I, she just, <laughs> she, she's struggling um, and neighbours, children are struggling so it's not just confined to mine you know I, there's three 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 of us on the same street who talk about our children and 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 the, the, the difficulty that they're having with life at currently um yes she does spend a lot of time on social media they you know they they, they consume youtube as opposed to tv like, like we sure, do but that that's fine it's it's what what he's pointing at um the the u.s surgeon general who was born in Yorkshire, would you believe? But what he's pointing out is the replacement of person-to-person social connection. So what did you do when you were 22? Were you in a football team? Did you go... I mean, the, what, what person-to-person social connection would, would you have had? I was involved with everything. Yeah, Boy Scouts, yeah. swimming club, everything going. And, and yeah, your daughter? Was, and what's your daughter signed up for? Sorry? What, what, what is your daughter signed up for at the moment? Well, at the moment, nothing. Yeah, you um, see. She, she, she's fallen, she, she, well, I don't say drop out, but she pulled out of university yeah. uh, after the first year. Um, struggled during the COVID period. I just said, no, she's not staying there then. I, in in isolation. Um, and um, 
they didn't understand the school. She had problems at school as well. Sure. Um, they didn't understand. And, and, and I can't really talk to my friends or, or, or family. They don't really get it. So you need specialists to talk to. So I'm in a lonely place as well. Trying like to understand it. Yeah. Um, where, how, what, what the prospects are for my daughter. Um, it, it, it's bleak. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, as I said, it, it, they don't watch telly in the way that we did. Um, they're, 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 they're on their tablets or and and that, or, and that, and the skills that you might have i mean your 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 daughter's situation is very specific to her clearly but the skills that might have helped her as in person to person contact as in so, social skills that you had little choice but to develop when we were young yeah. that, that it becomes almost a, a a perfect circle doesn't it because the lack of those skills makes everything worse moving forward it, it's probably why university partly why university was such a a bad experience for her because she hadn't developed at school the, the 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 mechanisms and the protections and the skills that would have set her in better stead. Absolutely, it's you, all you, there. You, you it's all there, Colin. It's all there, isn't it? And 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 I'll tell you something else. I don't know whether you'd put yourself in this category, but ten years ago or twelve years ago, if we'd had this conversation or if I'd heard someone else having this conversation, I'd have been. Oh, do get over yourself, Granddad. Honestly, who the hell would not? Who the hell would want to go out and? join the Boy Scouts when they can sit at home running a crime cartel in Vice City on their PlayStation. I, 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 think, I, I don't think I was an idiot about it. I'm always happy to put my hands up when I realised that I was an idiot in, in, in previous incarnations. I don't think I was an idiot on this one, but I was pretty committed to the notion that we were just moany old gits talking about how things were better in our day. But when you put names on it, when you label it with, with meaningful language like person-to-person -person social connection, Person-to-person -person social connection. If you've got a child in your life who struggles with person-to-person -person social connection, guess what? The reason why they struggle with person-to-person -person social connection is because they struggle with person-to-person -person social connection. That's why COVID is relevant. It's why Colin's right to mention it. Because for, for, for generations, the, 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 the period, particularly the kids moving from primary school to secondary school, who I think probably got hit hardest, for generations, they, they would not doing the stuff that every other generation had done. And now they're sort of 15, 16, 17, and they struggle with social connections. And that is going to be a, an exacerbated example of the broader malaise for, for everyone who has struggled with social connection because they spend so much time online. How do we fix it? How do we fix it? If Bill Gates can ban his children from using phones, maybe we were too quick to dismiss... Um, it, was, it was Brianna Guy's mum, wasn't it? It was Brianna Guy's mum who said we should try and actually go backwards and and i think that it felt like trying to put a genie back in the bottle but goodness me it's taken a month but i think she was probably 100 percent right thomas watts is here now with your headlines it is 10 at 34 and the uh the book i was referring to the author i was referring to um is is called jonathan Haidt. um H-I-D-T, and the book is called The Anxious Generation. I haven't read uh, his, his other book, which is called The Righteous Mind, which a couple of you have recommended to me already this morning. Uh, but The Anxious Generation essentially posits the notion that something got rewired, if you like, in young people, particularly between 2010 and 2015, uh, when flip phones, you remember flip phones, were being traded in for smartphones, and they were loaded with social media apps. So suddenly, time online soared, particularly, obviously, among young people who were always the most enthusiastic embracers of new technology. This meant less time engaging face-to-face -face or person-to-person -person contact with friends and family. Mental health began to decline, but at the same time, we were getting more protective. Some of the funniest phone-ins we did. My interests change as my children get older because of relevance and pertinence. We used to do quite a lot of phone-ins, didn't we, about how little freedom our children had compared to what we did when we were young. And the reason why I did it was because I was living it. It's still interesting. We should, we should stop doing that. I should be careful not to stop talking about things just because they're not immediately relevant to me anymore. But the idea, I used to tell you, didn't I, that my mum had a bell. So we, we grew up in the countryside, right on the edge of Kidderminster. And th there were farms, it was fields around us, and my mum had a bell. And really, at a very young age, we would just disappear, and mum would come out into the garden and ring a bell to summon us back from whatever corner of the countryside we'd, we'd drifted off into. I'd get on my bicycle with uh, some sandwiches. I'd make myself some sandwiches 
in a little backpack and just cycle off. I won the premium bonds when I was 10. I won 100 pounds on premium bonds. And I thought I was Rockefeller. I, I thought I was Rothschild. I thought I was the richest man in the world. I bought myself a drop hand, a racing bike with drop handlebars from Woolworths, Hawk Cycles. And I, and I thought I'd, I'd go everywhere. I just disappear for, for for hours on end and then come back. We used to talk about how much it has changed to the point where you don't really let your children cross the road. Never mind cross you know cross country. And and all of this happened at the same time, which Jonathan Haidt posits in the Anxious Generation deprives them of the experiences they most need to become strong and self governing adults, which sounds like a recipe for anxiety doesn't it and it's not the children's fault it's probably not fair to blame ourselves either but the sooner that we can hit reverse on some of these practices and trends the safer everyone will be graham's gareth i beg your pardon is in brixham in devon gareth what would you like to say oh, hi james uh fresh show otherwise um, I, I, I said to your uh, your producer the... mate i'm going to have to sort your phone line out i don't know what's happened while, while, while you it's probably my fault for banging on so much instead of coming straight to the to, straight to the phones but we will get you on i promise as soon as we fix that uh claire's in glasgow meanwhile claire what would you like to say um no claire will's in nottingham will what would you like to say Hi, James. You okay? Can you hear me? Yeah, you should have paused for a little bit longer then, because I was just beginning to think that the gremlins had got into the switchboard. They say two for two, going going rogue. If the third one goes rogue, then we've probably got to call engineering. But thank goodness you're here, Will. What would you like to say? <laughs> no, okay. Um, I'd just like to sort of challenge the notion that um, university campuses are quiet. Mm. I mean, I frankly, I'm not really sure what campuses or social... Um, situations they're putting themselves in but that's i think frankly just simply not true i mean i've been in the library all this week and i'm going to go back there today and the social areas in the libraries are packed they're alive and well uh same for the student student unions um and this is a university that only i mean less than a year ago obviously experienced the horrible horrific uh, murders last summer God, yes, um and it's bounced back um, within sort of seven, eight months. That's um, good to hear, isn't it? I mean, it's, I d- it's not a binary challenge. Part. I don't think it's a binary challenge. And, and your experience is no more indicative of, of, of a broader truth than Vivek Murthy talking about visiting communal areas at, at American colleges and being struck by the lack of loud chatter. I mean, both things can be simultaneously yeah. true, can't they? They can be as well. Um, but I'd also just like to highlight there are so many university sports, intramural sports. You see it every Wednesday. I think people are having lots of face-to-face contact. I mean, I mean, we've seen lots of nightclubs closed down in Nottingham around the country. Yes. And what that has resulted in is lots of young people absolutely packing out bars and pubs. And none of these people are on their phones. They are all engaging face-to-face. Um, I think so. Why? why? I because can... I, listen, I, 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 I risk of repeating myself. What you say is true, but the broader malaise, the broader trends are also true as well. That they're measurable. I mean, it's international polling, international research on on happiness quotients and, and things like that, and the numbers are are clear. The num the numbers are plain to see. So exceptions <laughs> never exceptions never prove rules. But just to to, to focus in on you and your peer group. Yeah. What, what, how come you eschew the, the the social media to a degree that other 23-year-olds don't? What, what, I mean, is it conscious? Are you particularly sporty? Are you particularly social? Have you Did you go to boarding school where person-to-person contact becomes compulsory? I'm just interested in what might have yeah. engineered you a bit. I mean, I mean, like yourself, I went to uh, I went to a private school, so perhaps that that private school swanning um, might have a might yes. have an impact. But um, I think. For me, for social media, what it has resulted in is perhaps a lack of resilience amongst people my age group. Yes. We are so used to now that instant gratification that uh, like our attention spans have been absolutely fried. Yes. I think um, when I speak to people my age and my peers, the problems that are most uh, present amongst them are the job market and also the cost of living and the housing market. I think social media is an underlying factor that simply enhances all of that because you will only ever see the highlights of other people's lives. Yes. 
Uh, you're the second twenty something. You're the second twenty something to say that. Just just treat me like an old git. That should be very easy for you. <laughs> and tell me why that's different from me telling my dad in 1980 that I was the only kid in the class that didn't have a mini motorbike. I, it wasn't true then and it isn't true now that everyone's having a better life than me, but you're more likely to believe it if you're in your generation than mine. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think perhaps it's that generational gap and I'm in that gap. I'm in that part of that generation that's sort of, I'm 23. I grew up, I can remember a period where there weren't, where social media wasn't really a thing yes. and I can remember its, its advent almost. Um, so I've seen sort of both sides of it. But, well, you're um, banging it, aren't you? Because Jonathan Haidt yeah. posits it as being between 2010 and 2015 when he describes it as childhood and adolescence getting rewired. Yeah. So, I mean, I started secondary school in sort of 2010, 2011. So, like you said, I'm sort of banging that generation. Um, and I, 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 just, I just have to keep highlighting that resilience. I think it's lowered our resilience because we are so used to having things instantly on social media and only ever seeing the highlights of other people's lives. Yes, um, and, and we've I, diminished your freedoms as well. I, I mean, this is why I was interested in the kind of school that you went to because private schools, boarding schools in particular, create a, 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 a kind of supervised freedom, if you like, which you don't get at home anymore. You used to get it at home but you don't get it at home anymore on anything like the scale that you used to, which is, again, why, why they talk about diminishing childhood freedom, over-supervision by parents, much more terrified. i got parents who still send their kids to boarding schools, and they never worry about their parents. They never worry about their kids. Their kids are at boarding school. They don't need to worry about them. Someone else is looking after them. Whereas if your kid is missing, you're just literally coming home from school, and they disappear off the iPhone tracker or whatever it is, you start having kittens. And, and that gets communicated. So the children don't know what it's like to be off uh, radar, as it were, to be, to be under, the, under the wire. So it all, I, I honestly think that we've got... I'm glad you're here. I'm glad Will has reminded us that, that no one is suggesting this is a universal condition or that it's the end of civilization as we know it. But anyone who's being cynical or sceptical about this needs to tell me why Mark Zuckerberg, Steve Jobs and Bill Gates police their children's access to technology and particularly social media a hell of a lot more than you probably do. Um, Gareth is in Brixham. Gareth, hopefully we fixed the line. What would you like to say? Yeah, I can... I can uh, hi, James. Hi. I can relate to um, one of your previous callers. It was like I'd weirdly sent my message in with through someone else Gosh. my daughter's my daughter's 22 um she started suffering from anxiety at school and then at around about 19 it got really bad right um but then we, we were lucky in brixham she, she we, we got a big support network um oh really we, yeah we, as, as a family we're not we're not religious but that she was sent to a uh, charity group that was um, through the church, and she absolutely loved it. Did music, did editing, got the social skills to talk to other other kids. She she always suffered with only being able to have one friend at a time. Yeah, and and if she wanted a different friend, then she'd have to fall out with that friend. And oh. So, but th this really helped, and it was a massive turning point for her. She got a good job, um, and then she had an illness. It was only a cold, yeah. bad bad cold. And her job said, um, she said, I, I want to carry on working. Um, I don't want to just take time off sick. Oh, OK, you can uh, work from home for a little bit. And, and I believe that was the worst thing for her that ever happened because mm. she w went back into herself. She was uh, in, the, in the room. That she, she wasn't living with us, but right. she lived in a room. She gamed in a room. She watches YouTube in that room. And then when she was working... She'd then all of a sudden room. she was working in the room. So then she never left the room. Um, she is, so it becomes an almost not not a parental uh, over supervision. It was almost as if she she the walls closed in. It was almost as if she shut herself yeah. off because yeah. te can, because and, technology and en enabled her to. Technology let yeah. her. Yeah, and and I think when I think employees, it was a great employee, but of course, uh, em employer the they should. They should have more of an involvement and then realise that what, what's the best thing. Yes. You know, we could, we could, she would have been better off having two weeks off sick and then going back into work, not carry on working, because then she'd got the habit of going, oh, I'm going to work from home, I'm going to work from home. It, and then she isolated herself from the rest of the office. She missed out on opportunities uh. and then thought it was a personal attack on her. 
and then well, that's what anxiety uh, and, and, spirals yeah. like that, doesn't it? And everything and it, becomes. And it, yeah, that's it. And in the end, she she ended up um, kind of leaving the job before I suppose before they fired her. I'm sorry. Um, so she's she's now unemployed, but she is looking. Good. And she told me last week that she is feeling a lot better in herself. She's using the tools that was given to her by the support group. So she's getting um, out. I mean, it is, but I don't think she, per- person-to-person yeah. contact sounds simplistic, but I don't think there's anything yeah. that will do the yeah. work that person-to-person contact will do, is there? And one, one, of the, one, of the very, one of the things that made me smile the week is she said, um, I am feeling better in myself. I, love re- I always loved reading. I started reading again. Okay. And I'm like, that's just to hear that. Oh. That's coming away from it a little bit from the social media and going, I'm reading a book that's and I'm really enjoying it. Inner life, isn't it? Inner life yeah. as opposed to yeah. everything being like stimuli. What's yeah. it like for you? Because the, 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 there's a phrase I haven't said on the radio for a while because it's not 100% accurate. But there's an idea that we can only ever be as happy as our unhappiest child. And so for you Mm. to be watching this and to be making those unavoidable but probably unhelpful comparisons with 22-year-old you or 19-year-old you, what's it it like for you, Gareth? It is really tough because obviously she's my daughter and I love her to bits. Um, Sometimes you get to the point where you... We're of a generation Mm. and you just want to go... just get older yourself. Yeah, and and for for me, I've, I've in in the past, I've 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 been treated for depression and anxiety, right. and and it took a while, but I took it by the cunies sure, and, and yeah. went, I'm not letting it do that to me. And but those things that and she pointed it out, those things that worked for me, exercise, getting out and about, walking on the coast path, going in the sea. Yes. Um, she said she did say those things worked for you. They they don't work for me. And it's and, and you think, well, maybe they don't work for you. Um, and that's what's tough. I've got to get the balance of supporting her and... Remembering that she's not you. Yeah. It's, no, that's what I was... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You've put that perfectly. That's what I was trying to say when I said it's not... No one can ever be 19 twice. The things that work for you might not work for her. The frustration as a parent, as you say, is that... Um, uh, that, that, that belief that they probably would if you just gave them a chance, but that helps nobody. That helps nobody. Gary, thank you, mate. Uh, uh, that's been incredibly powerful. A lot of people responding as you, as you were speaking. Um, uh, uh, phone lines are still open on this. Ten forty-eight is the time. Ten fifty-two is the time. PMQ is coming up at twelve o'clock. Also on the way, an explanation. Uh, I, you may have to get the tin for this one, Keith. The, the the stuff about asylum seekers and hotels, which I think I was the only person calling correctly as long ago as, as as a year or two and i've now been proved quite gloriously right about it, it an, an extraordinary development today that you may have heard in the news bulletins but the reason for it is the sort of deliberate gaslighting well i don't even know if it's a deliberate gaslighting because a lot of the politicians punting it seem to believe it themselves that's been the really interesting change for me in the post-Brexit period has been the, uh, you know, the the Rupert Murdoch approach to manipulating the public, encouraging them to vote against their own interests, being done by very cynical, dishonest people who were getting paid a lot of money to lie and to mislead. Whereas what's changed is that now the people who are encouraging people to vote against their own interests appear to believe that it's as if they've swallowed their own snake oil. I, I, you know, even Farage, I think, doesn't believe half of the stuff he comes out. Well, he can't, can he? Because he contradicts himself so much. So he's just opportunistic. But this new breed of Tory, that they seem to actually believe the bilge that they then sell to the British public. That that might be part of the reason why the latest development in the in the Bibby Stockholm story and the whole asylum seeker situation is so unbelievably. Brexity, um, and we'll we'll discuss that shortly as well. But before all of that, we continue with our conversation about, I, I mean, possibly the most important issue of our age, apart from climate, will be the unhappiness of young people, the anxiety being endured by young people, and crucially, I think, the relationship between that transformation in technology that took place between 2010 and 2015 when your phone ceased to be a means of communication and became instead a means of entertainment and uh and and uh, isolation and the effects that that is having and the first generation to have endured that now in their most formative years think of the brain as clay it is in that period of time 
that your brain is is molded, is formed, is cast. And if you're of the relevant age, you'd now be 15 to 24. If you were caught in that 2010 to 2015 pincer, and now we're seeing, I think, the consequences. It's extraordinary, right? Claire's in Glasgow. Claire, what would you like to say? Hi, uh, James. Hello. Um, th- I, I have four children, uh, ranging from 12 to 20, and I have seen, as each of them have kind of come of age to get a phone, I have seen like the rapid deterioration in or the loss of the child that I, I knew. Gosh. So I, I see it literally, they slip away in front of you, and each of the children have have handled it and reacted in slightly different ways. Um, my, my first, my oldest, is um, really strong kind of personality, strong character. And so she actually was really robust. But what happens within her friendship group is six little girls that have travelled through school that I'd, I'd seen grow up yes. in their life. By the time she left high school, four of them had a diagnosable anxiety depressive condition. Good Lord. Now, uh, one of them, you know, one of them just permanently sat in her echo chamber on TikTok, um, making her TikTok videos. It, it was so tragic to see it happen. Um, she uh, uh, she needs constant reminding that the the world that she sees on social media is not real. It's it's the best. It's the, it's the so pretend, she, she, so the best this is th- th- this is the most common theme that's emerged this hour, and yeah. and and you and me don't really get it. We know that it's true. But we don't have personal lived experience of it. We can only see it happening to younger people. In your case, it's horrifying when you see what's happening. It's, it's it's horrifying when you see it happening to the kids around you. And and what's really frustrating is we are all in denial because I it's think we are. so easy. It's such an easy babysitter. Yeah. And I I see my my brother's an old father. Um, right. He's, he's fifty odd for his, his first two children come along, and. Um, and of course, he said oh, that will never happen to him. And already, and I'll and I'll go round, and of course, the wee ones sitting there with a laptop, and and it's and it's sitting there with the you know the cartoons and all sorts going on, and it's 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 just too easy. And we're not addressing it because we know we it's the parents that will have to make such a massive shift in their life to address it. And but I, I, we can't hide from it any longer. I I as I said. Um, I've seen each of them react differently. So the the twenty year old now is she's she's a medic. Uh, she's doing fantastic in her life and in, in her world. But most of the girls around her are are on antidepressants. So what did you do differently? So I, I'm just forever on it. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm forever on it. And it's, this is what you mean by denial. So because it's exhausting being yeah. forever on it. Yeah. I mean, even yeah. describing and, 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 it in and, and that language, it's, it's ex- also and, out of sight, out of mind. If you, your daughter's upstairs in her room doing goodness knows what on social media, nothing unhealthy or, well, nothing illegal or objectively dangerous, but, but probably unhealthy, it means that you can get on with watching your programs yeah. and you don't have to yeah. worry about, you know, uh, what, what, what it and is that's going tragically, on. Tragically, she, 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 was, she was strong. Tragically, then you come to the boys, and of course, all the material that that is exposed to young boys growing up, and and one of them in particular, I knew instantly there was something going on because with your own boy, boy this is with your own happy. son. Yes, that's, that's my own son. Go on. Um, and of course, it's it's it's, por- it's pornography that's that's so available. So apart, it's all it's all wrapped up in the whole screen time, social media, yeah. and it's all first exposed from friends, introduce them to all this stuff. But a child who is just so happy, so zest for life, literally just disappears in front of you. Suddenly, you've got a, a child then becomes highly anxious and mm. quick to anger and and upset because they they have no idea how to cope with, with the things that they're getting exposed to and. It's, it's horrific. So what, what horrific. have you done? Have you got him back or is he still in this? Yes, absolutely. How? I, and again, I would say how? after, again, it's just, I mean, it's, just it's, on it's, it. it's, it's weird that you, you literally, you restrict the screen time, you you take the phone away, it comes out of their bedrooms and, and, and so quickly you get them back again and they're so thankful and relieved that you start to put those boundaries in. I don't think that's maybe what people will understand is that you think you'll be so unpopular but they are so thankful to you because it, they can't resist the temptation and the urge. They would desperately probably want to. You don't hear the laughter. You don't hear the fun. You don't hear children squealing with delight on a, on, on social media. No. But they do when you put the phone down and their friends are around or they're out kicking ball in the park. In the, you know, 
doing doing real stuff. So they they're having a better time not on social media, but they just don't know how to say no. And we have to say no for them. So you're you're a, a sort of early adopter of what ten years from now will hopefully oh, hell, be. Oh I saw it. My God, I saw it. So well, quickly. we've all seen and, it, maybe, but you you yeah. recognised it. It's not it's no good yeah. just seeing it. You've got to recognise yeah, what you're seeing, and most parents haven't recognised what they're seeing. And having and having the time to say, right, I I need to address this. I need to stop this. This needs to stop because it's killing and it's killing my family. And it won't be enough. It won't be enough for parents. It won't be enough. It's going to have to be government led, and it's going to have to involve mandatory guardrails on social media platforms, which brings me back to Vivek Murthy, the US Surgeon General, talking about the complete failure of these companies to, to do it officially, which makes the contrast between what they're doing in their own homes and what they're pumping into our homes, I mean, absolutely unbelievable. I, 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 I urge you to read that article that I mentioned. It's, it's, it's six years ago, but the headline, and it's probably... Well, that's not paywalled as far as I can tell. Why are Silicon Valley execs banning their kids from using social media. Claire knows, but most of us don't. And they know, even as they buy their enormous mansions and their new, brand new jet planes with the money that they've raised as a consequence of everybody else's kids not being banned from social media. It's 11.01. Five minutes after 11 is the time you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Uh, we're going to stay with that, actually. I, I, I think Claire just kicked the conversation into a new space. Uh, and that space is how you actually fix it. So we'll do something that we should probably do more often, which is spend an hour examining a problem and then half an hour or 40 minutes coming up with solutions to it. Because Claire said so much that I found fascinating, so resonant. There's the idea, how do you fix it? How do you get your boy back if he's gone down a pornography rabbit hole or he's fallen under the spell of online misogynists? How do you get... You've just got to be on it all the time. That's the biggest thing, isn't it, about our generation of parents and, and our parents' generation of parents. It was a full-time job being a parent, and yet they were not doing full-time supervision. So we do constant supervision, but when our child is at home, we don't do any. We're paranoid the moment they go out the front door. Listen, I, I can't, I'm not speaking for everybody, and I've, I've told you a few times, I've been, we've been lucky in this field personally with ours, but generally speaking... There's no anxiety when they're at home, uh, unless they're too poorly to go out. So we've spoken to two dads today whose daughters have been unable sometimes to engage with the outside world, such as the scale of their anxiety. So even if they're in their room, you're, you're going to be sitting there with your, with your guts churning, with your tummy doing somersaults, because you can only ever be as happy as your unhappiest child. But, but generally speaking, when, when, they're, when they're getting through life, you're paranoid when they're out of the house, but you're fine when they're in it. And it should probably be the other way around. Oh, that sounded almost profound, didn't it? It should probably be the other way around. You should, you should be paranoid when they're at home, plugged into social media, developing these unhealthy habits and avoiding the scenarios that we would describe as person-to-person -person social connection or face-to-face activity, social interaction, probably the finest cure for much of the social anxiety that this generation is suffering from. So we should be a lot more on it, to use Claire's phrase, when they're at home, and a lot less on it when we're, when they're not. How bizarre is that? How bizarre? I, I, I don't know how old you are. You may not even have children in the relevant zone. You may not have children at all. But you were a child once. Of that, I'm certain. How mad is that? That that is, and, and apologies if if you're sitting there going, yeah, well done, James. Also, the Pope's a Catholic and bears sha la 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 in the woods. But I think this is a really big penny drop moment. So we're paranoid when they're out and completely chilled when they're in. Whereas in fact, the dangers are when they're in compared to when. Uh, anyway. Uh, seven minutes after 11 is the time. PMQ's on the way at 12. That'll be a doozy. And I, well, I hope it will be a doozy. And I'll talk you through this incredible development in the so-called stop the boat story that I honestly think we were the only people to see coming. I genuinely think we were the only people to see it coming. So we will allow ourselves a moment of reflection shortly. But before that, back to the phones and then and then a bit of a rejig on the question of what you actually do. You, you are like Claire. You've spotted this problem early 
and you have taken measures to fix it. What are those measures and how are you how are you getting on or indeed how did you get on? Uh, but before that, Dave's in Wrexham. Dave, what made you pick up the phone? Morning, James. Hello, mate. Um, so basically, yeah, I've got a 12-year-old lad, um, a nine-year-old daughter. No, it's my 12-year-old lad that I've uh, noticed it more. And he's obviously not long started high school. Yes. And a bit of a backstory, he's not athletic. He's not. He's not into that. Neither am I. I'm a retro gamer. I'm into all that anyway. So growing up, he's he's come along with me, uh, Minecraft and things like that. And he's really been into his technology. Okay. But since he hit high school, we we had to give him a mobile phone. One because we need to know. You know, we need to be in contact with him if he's in high school. Um, he's got that bit more freedom now. And obviously, all his peer group have phones. But we always said no social media. You know that that's it. You can have YouTube, but you're not having TikTok or, or yeah, Twitter yeah, yeah. or anything like that. Um, but we have noticed a massive difference in him. And all he does now, instead of going out to play with his mates, they all go home and they play online together. And they're on the laptops. They're then they're not doing face to face interaction. And about. About a year ago now, we started noticing that he, he'd turn around and say, like, oh, uh, we're going out this weekend, mate. You, you, we just here, there. And wh- wh- where are we going? Yeah. Oh, it just needs a pop to Tesco. Uh, no, 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 I'm not going to Tesco. Why? What's up? It's too many people. And what do you mean? I, I, I can't do crowds. I can't. And he's become isolated and insular within the, um, within the house because all of his social interaction is through a screen. And not, as you say, face to face and around people. The physical contact—it's it, disappeared. It's moved away. It's extraordinary to hear you describe it in in such straightforward terms. Because it's—I mean, it sounds extraordinary. What's happening? It's like it sounds like a, a form of an experiment in, mm-hmm. in the self isolation of a twelve-year-old boy. But it is going to be a story that is playing out in millions of houses up and down the country. Loads of people listening will be recognizing what you're describing. Before this morning. Did you realise how potentially a serious a problem this was? Yes, of yeah, course definitely. You did. Of course you did. And um, what can you do about it? Well, we you, there's two ways you can go. Really, you could go absolutely nuclear, and you can. Uh, and Claire's absolutely right. By the way, your previous caller, yeah? you need to be all over it. You do because it's so counterintuitive. Because they're fine when they're on it. They're, they're, we know that. I mean, Gaz has been in touch to say our parents were. We could relax when we were in the house because they knew they, they, they knew we, we were okay. They wanted us to stay in more so that they knew what we were up to. And now we want them to go outside and, and, and start playing. It's crazy. Yeah, because, well, kids have got two sets of parents, haven't they? They've got their biological parents and then they've got the corporations yeah, who will so. happily look after them because they're good consumers, aren't they? And they're the ones um, that don't let their own kids have the access that we let our kids have. So what have you, what have you done? How are you handling it, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, well, he's... He's also he's very passionate about flight and aircraft. Okay. Uh, he wants he wants to fly one way, shape or form. And we're yeah, great, go for it, mate. So we've got him involved with the local RAF air cadets. Um and we thought, come on, we've got to try him with this, yeah. Yeah. And he, he had he had the taste of the chess and, and that was it. He was hooked. Right. You know, and he goes twice a week. You got uh, him out of the house. I mean it it, it sometimes sometimes it is straightforward. And that is something that the Surgeon General mentions, uh, the American Surgeon General, talking about getting out and simply getting out and doing things, joining clubs, teams, yeah. volunteering, faith groups. could be anything, just something that gets you into a space yeah. full of other people with whom you have to communicate. Yeah, and it took us six or seven attempts. You know, the people will be there, like, oh, I tried that with football, and then they, they, they don't want to do it. My lad's not, like I said, he's not athletic, he, you know, and... You know, we tried him with rugby and football, and he he pays an interest in in karate. Oh, go on then, mate, have a go, and he'll he'll go two three times, and then instantly he'll he'll switch and he go no, not doing it, and that that's kids. I I did yeah, that sure. as a kid, sure. But you, you've got to just keep going. You've got to invest in your child because if you don't invest in your child, the corporations will, and that your child could potentially make them a lot of money. Such a good way of putting it. And and, and that investment can be huge. As, as you were speaking, Dave, Ian texted and said, it is honestly awful, James, and you have to be on it at all times. So we control TV, console, tablet time, much to the disgust of my, of my children. Most of their friends get to do what they want. 
So you then feel as a parent like you're stopping your kids from fitting in with their own social groups because they're not allowed to play Call of Duty or watch Certificate 18 films. Um, I, there is something there. But again, you know, it, what are they doing instead? They're sitting staring at a wall. You're probably not doing them an enormous favour. And their friends, when they're playing Call of Duty, are at least talking to each other. But as Dave says, that creates a scenario when they don't even want to leave the room. There's, I tell you what I find fascinating about these conversations is the themes, the threads that run through all the calls, even though they sound outwardly different. You're talking about a 22-year-old woman or a 12-year-old boy. I, outwardly very different, but the themes here, you had to, you had to hang them on words. You'd probably go for self-isolation, even when you don't realize you're isolated because your mates are on the other end of your headphones. But those words there, person-to-person -person social connections... And the U.S. Surgeon General tracking it in America, warning about Western European nations, flew to London uh, this month to further his campaign against falling levels of happiness, particularly worried about Japan, South Korea and India, which are probably also particularly exposed to the technology. So why then, and this is a, a question that you can contribute to answering, why then are Finland, Iceland and Denmark getting it right. What, why are they the countries in which the same cohort of young people routinely report much higher levels of happiness? They're not like third world countries where access to technology is limited or denied. Finland, Iceland, Denmark. What's going on? What are they getting right that we, and I use the word loosely but correctly, that we are getting so, so wrong? It is 18 minutes after 11, and I, I, listen, we can't underestimate the um, positives of social media because I have just seen a post from the president of Finland uh, answering precisely the question I just asked. And, you know, also, uh, as we talk about the positives of social media, he turns out he follows me on Twitter, so I could actually DM him now. I, I imagine he's a bit busy being president. He's being a bit busy being president of Finland, Alexander Stubb is his name. I could DM him now because we follow each other and get him to come on and tell us what Finland's getting so right. But in the, I, 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 in the absence of that interaction, let me read you his reasons for why Finland has become the happiest country in the world for seven years in a row. Um, he goes for these three, nature, trust and education. So what is different? Because nature is the same everywhere, isn't it? And fear of uh, environmental damage, I think, is part of the anxiety that young people feel. Trust, that's probably a consequence of face-to-face -face social interacting. You're much more likely to be a trusting person if you have personal relations um, and education. So, I mean, he's made a list of things, but he hasn't explained how they work. Why, why would Finland, Iceland and Copenhagen, particularly in the context of education, be getting right stuff that we seem to be getting wrong? Let me read you this as well from Catherine. This is extraordinary. Talk about being in the moment that, that, that we're discussing on the radio. Catherine wrote to me at qu quarter past 11, so it literally just dropped five minutes ago. My 11-year-old was added to his year six group, so that will probably be, what's it called? Not WhatsApp, Snapchat, wouldn't it be? Probably It'd be Snapchat, would it? Or, or, anyway, I don't know. My 11-year-old was added to his year six group for the first time last night at 5 p.m., right? 400 messages later, at 7 p.m., I removed him from the group and restricted him from being re-added. He was relieved. It is our job to do this. Children do not have the ability to do it for themselves. Now, I owe Catherine a sort of theoretical apology because five years ago, if I'd read that, I think I would have teased her. I may even have called her cruel. Today... The longer this conversation goes on, the more I wonder whether Catherine's got everything right, like Claire in Glasgow, and the parents who think that their kids are okay because they're in, or even who worry that their kids haven't been added to the Year 6 group because they don't want them to be socially isolated or, or whatever it may be. We just don't know enough about what they're experiencing to be confident in our own choices. And the people who sound confident today are the people who are making the choices for their children, which is what parenting always used to be. 
Would you, for example, oh man, I, 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 I tell you what, when I change my mind about something, I really change it. Because now do you know what I'm thinking? Would you let your children decide what they're having for tea every night? If your children wanted to have Haribo for tea every night, would you let them? What do you want for breakfast? Minstrels, please, Dad. What do you want for lunch? Haribo, please. Tangfastics. Fant- is it Tangfastics or Fantastics? Either way. Fizzy sweets. What do you want for dinner? Ah, oh, more Haribo, please. What, what, I mean, would you let them do that? Or would you exercise control over their diet? So you're, you're exercising control over their physical diet. You're exercising no control whatsoever over their mental diet. Would you let them watch whatever they wanted on television? Would you let them come down and put porn on telly in the sitting room? Or, you know, really violent, really, really violent films? Because they're probably watching them on their phone. Unless you are really, really on it. And some of us are, some of us will be. But lots of us aren't, especially as they get older. That's 15, 16, 17 years old now. Okay, would you let them eat whatever they want? Would you let them have Haribo for breakfast? Would you buy it, fill the cupboards with Haribo instead of, instead of toast and cereal? Would you? No, of course you wouldn't. Of course you wouldn't. So why, why are we not controlling our diet of mental input with at least as much concern as we try and exercise control over the diet of physical input? Answer, uh, easy. Lazy? Don't know. Ronan's in Brighton. Ronan, what would you like to say? Hello, you're right, James. Uh, Tangfastics, that one as well. Thank you very Um, much. There you go. Everyone's a fact checker. (laughs) Yes, yes. No, exactly. Um, Yeah, no, I think you're tapping into something extremely important about how to necessarily challenge and tackle this issue. I mean, I I find it extremely interesting because, I mean, I'm 22, but I've got um, a brother that's, five years older than a sister that's seven years older. Right. Right. So we went to very similar schools, um, very similar backgrounds, of course, same parents. Um, and they went on, carried on. They went and Russell Group universities, masters, etc. You know, but for yes. me, uh, they, they introduced iPads for us when we were in year eight into the school right. with little to no knowledge. Um, you know, this is, this is a state comprehensive education, secondary school. And then yes. all of a sudden, you know, Sunday League turned into FIFA, you know, you can do literally anything. And how, what can my mum do when all of a sudden, yeah. all of a sudden she's working all the time, same as my dad, and and literally at school I'm playing on the iPad. At lunch times, no one's in the field playing. Everyone is on the, on the iPad. And it's so scary because literally every new week, something new is coming out. It's, you know, it's, it's Instagram or TikTok or, yeah. you know, there's always yeah. a new application. Yeah. It's so emerging. It's so developing. It's almost impossible to judge. And, and, and what ended up happening is I ended up only getting only actually four GCSEs and, 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 you know, it took me a lot, a lot longer. And I think there is definitely some form of direct relation to that relationship that I had with that iPad, there, there, there must be. Social, there must be just simple media. distraction. You were you weren't doing, and and to be able to compare your trajectory with your siblings, puts it into even starker light, doesn't it? So what was different for them compared to you? Answer, technology. I mean specifically, answer that single item of technology there that dropped into your hand uh, at year eight in year eight, and and had, have yeah. you have you weaned yourself off it? And and also, when did your parents realise? Presumably when yeah. your GCSE results drop through the letterbox, metaphorically speaking. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, yeah, no. I mean, it started tapping into it, sort of, you know, what, you know, what, what's, what's, what's Ronan going to do now? Sort yeah. Of thing, you know, but, um, but eventually it hits a point where, and this I think is a really important point about, you know, my parents are sort of academics and right. working media, et cetera, and they were able to, to find me the resources and sort of give me a bit of perspective about maybe what I wanted to, to do and achieve with my life. And I actually managed to, you know, so I ended up doing an access course and I went to, um, you know, I do, I, I now study uh, education at UCL and actually a lot of it is to do, um, <laughs> I've actually done quite a lot of Finland actually. And what what um, are they doing right, Ronan? What are Finland doing right that we're not? Basically, they're not hiding away from it. What Finland are doing is they're approaching it in a constructive, healthy way where they're not being like, this is this is harmful. This is dangerous. Okay. This is because it is, but they're more constructive with it, and they're applying it educationally in a very important way. And the and the bit I'm getting onto is the education is so important. Since being at UCL, the, those people that I see that were able to go to go to grammar schools or, or private schools and mm. play hockey and and involved with that stuff, 
that's you know that's great and they've got such confidence and they're talking very eloquently and you know but i go home and i see my friends from the state education you know secondary school i was there's been two people from my school that have been semi-directly linked you know to death through social media you know God. and it's um and it's shocking so i think there's a really well, it's a chicken becoming... it's chicken and egg as well isn't it natasha's listening today natasha devon and she she points out that people with good mental health use social media less because it can be a coping yeah. mechanism for, for depression or anxiety yeah. as well as an exacerbator. So the chain of causation goes in both directions. That's why I touched lightly on educational environments earlier. I didn't want to sound snobbish or judgmental, but if your school has a lot of societies, if your school has a lot of sports teams, if your school has a lot of opportunities to volunteer or, or sign up, uh, th then your opportunities for person-to-person -person social connection increase exponentially, don't they? I mean, it's, 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 yeah. it's obvious that. And in Finland also, they don't start school until later. They learn through play. Fewer tests, smaller classes. It's not all about technology. You wouldn't have been given an iPad in year eight, I don't think. And then, and then the you know, and then the, the the alternative life might have unfolded in front of you. Although, as you say, the other advantage is having middle class parents who can get you back on the straight and narrow, who know about access courses, who recognise opportunities lost does not necessarily mean opportunities missed. Or, or do I mean that the other way round? Debbie's in Portsmouth. Debbie, what would you like to say? Oh, hi. Um, Hello, Debbie. I just wanted to call in because I think I'm probably a, a rare parent locally because I joined a smartphone-free childhood WhatsApp group that's kind of, I think there's a bit of a movement in different areas. Uh, and I shared it on my WhatsApp group for my youngest child. Right. And um, You mean with the parents of his mates, science. the pa parents yeah. of his peers? Well, actually, it was my daughter's peers who daughter's. a bit younger because okay. I thought they might be. But my, my, my son is at uh, middle school, so he's now the youngest year of an older group of children. Yeah. Um, so I kind of had a felt like I needed to have a few chats with him, you know, whilst he started the bigger school, if you like. Yes. Um, and I asked him one day, I said to him, do you know, have you heard the word porn? Do you know what that is? Hmm. And he said, yeah, it's, you know, people having sex. Yeah. And I said, have you been shown anything like that? And he said, no. And I said, well, you know, you're at school with kids with phones. There's a chance at some point you might be asked, do you want to see something or have a look at this on my phone? Um, and just had a chat with him about how what you see online isn't how things should be in a loving relationship and that if he sees something, you can't unsee it once you've seen it. So he needs to be very careful about what he chooses to look at. Because on the smartphone phones. takes away any control you have over what is going to be passed under his eyes, doesn't it? Exactly. Even exactly. if it's not his own smartphone. I, I used to, well, I still do occasionally tell a story about three boys on a bus about the same age as yours. And, uh, and one of them showing the other two stuff that was obviously shocking and, and it yeah, being yeah. a revelation for me to see how commonplace that was and how little control the parents of the other two had over what they were going to see, even if they thought that they did. Tell me more about the radio silence. So you thought that other parents would be interested in the opportunity of, of creating... Yeah, so I'm a, probably on, a little yeah. bit anti... I'm not on social media and I try to be Yes, you are. You're in a WhatsApp group, group, group for your youngest daughter. Possible. You're in a WhatsApp well, okay. group for your youngest daughter, you fibber. So... For Orla, I'm on the WhatsApp group for the school, but yes. for my son, I've decided that when he started his new school, I didn't want to be on any. Right. Um, just because I find it difficult as an adult to yeah. keep up with, yeah. you know, the, the ins and the outs of it all. Um, so when I joined this smartphone-free childhood WhatsApp group, I thought, oh, maybe I'll share that on yes. her group. There might be people that would be interested in hearing more about that. And it was n not even like a thumbs-up WhatsApp Sign, nothing. nothing. No yeah. one's interested. So you're a very early, like Claire in Glasgow, I don't know if you heard her call, that the, the, at the moment, parents like you and Ian, who texted us about really exercising serious control over what his children can and can't access, you're in a very small minority at the moment. It feels, it definitely feels that way. And even when you talk to your friends about it, um, you sort of feel a little bit like, you know, you're the odd one out and... and yes everybody else is on the same page and you just need to catch up. Yes, you know? yes, um, yes. And, that, and, and it would have, five years ago, it would have stood out even in this context. The conversation would have made you sound weird or, or I would have been rude to you for, for being a misery guts who was denying your children the most obvious 
pleasures. And and yet, I 100% changed my mind. I've I've, got, I've done a full 180 on this. It seems to me absolutely clear. And if there was a clincher, Debbie, it would be the behaviour of the of the tech broskies in Silicon Valley. They're not letting their children have access to this stuff, but they're happy, of course, to um, build enormous fortunes, the likes of which we haven't seen since the 19th century, off the back of our children using it. My mate Keith uh, has been in touch, not my colleague Keith, my mate Keith, I know two Keiths, I have two Keiths in my life, uh, and he points out that it's drug dealers and social media companies who describe their customers as users. <laughs> it probably doesn't necessarily stand up to full scrutiny, that I'm sure there are others as well, but certainly pause for thought. It is 11.32, and Thomas Watts is here now with your headlines. It is 11.36. I, I think we all owe Jason in Crawley an apology, all right? and, and I mean you as well, not just me. So Jason has, uh, has messaged me to say, about eight years ago, I rang LBC regarding social media and children harming themselves, and I said that we needed to tell the social media companies to try harder or they would be banned. I was laughed at and told that we're not in China. I'm hoping this was not on my show, Jason, and I'm thinking that you may have mentioned it if it was. I'm always very loath to accept criticism of other presenters while I'm on air, but um, if it was me, then I can apologise. If it wasn't me, I, I, I can't really apologise. I can simply sympathise or even empathise. I was laughed at and told we're not in China. Uh, we need to give these companies uh, an ultimatum and follow through if they break it. And so if you were laughed at and insulted eight years ago, isn't it remarkable that you now sound of an entire piece with the US Surgeon General, who, who literally talks about governments having been slow to install precisely the sort of mandatory guardrails that you describe, and who adds, what has happened is a fundamental failure of governments to protect young people from the harmful effects of new technology, and it's not new anymore. Uh, he says, think about policies that carve up our cities and towns with highways and roadways and separate us from one another. All the other areas doing the sort of equivalent of me saying, would you let the kids have Haribo for breakfast every day? All at, just think of another area of life where you just hand over complete responsibility for your child's welfare to, to strangers who have no interest whatsoever in their health. So even if you hand them over to a school, the school is in loco parentis. But you're handing them over, you're just letting them sit in a room full of strangers and giving the strangers full control over what happens for the next three hours. How many people, I don't know, do you, you remember I said to you yesterday, I wish we had little buttons to press when I could somehow read your mind. I just, how many people have had a moment like mine today? How many people are listening to this and thought, oh, not another phone in about social media? And then 10 minutes into it, just suddenly thought, do you know what? We've been doing it all wrong. We've been doing it all wrong. Some of you may even have thought, Jason in Crawley was right all along. I remember when he was accused of thinking that, that sounding like something out of communist China eight years ago. But it, so uh, how many other parents today? Because a lot of parents have recognised the reality of what we've described, but, uh, but, but from the other end of the telescope, by, by looking at a child who's unhappy. But to recognise the social failure, the epic political and social failure in this field is, I can't remember a show like this one, when something that we've talked about so often has transformed, has undertaken a 180-degree U-turn in real time, live on the radio. I would have dismissed it even a month ago, maybe, even certainly a year ago. I'd be, oh, do calm down. The only reason you think that is because you don't realise how amazing technology is or you haven't played video games or whatever. This is absolutely, absolutely urgent. And fair play to Dr Vivek Murthy, the US Surgeon General, Yorkshire-born Surgeon General of, of the whole, the most senior doctor in the whole of America. But, as I've said to you on a few occasions, when we've knocked at the door of today's realisations, you've got you've only one way you can hurt these companies. And that's in the pocket. There's only one way you hurt them. Facebook's never going to do anything for the benefit of your child unless it is made financially compulsory for them to do so. TikTok, Snapchat, none of them are ever going to do anything to look after your children, ever, unless they face financial consequences for not doing so or legal consequences as executives start getting locked up in jail none of them are ever ever going to do anything to look after your children unless they are forced to by politicians and remember the direction of traffic in this country at the moment supposed to be moving towards a smaller state and less regulation that's great 
just when we need a bigger state and more regulation to save a generation of children from uh, free market, if you like, being introduced, being free markets eating their childhood. You've got your Tufton Street vampires and their friends in the Tory party trying to steer the country in the precisely the opposite direction. Extraordinary. 11.41 is the time. Barry is in Preston. Barry, what made you pick up the phone? Um, I just really wanted to talk about... My son's having a horrendous time. Um, He's 15. Um, You know, this morning I more or less had to drag him to school. And he's depressed. He's kind of killing me to do that. Um, You know, I'm being a hypocrite because I've had mental health problems for years. And um, he's just making me feel terrible. But I'm coming at this from another direction. And... My direction is that one of the things he's saying to me is he he, find, he doesn't see the point in doing yes. a lot of the stuff that he's doing. And when I say he doesn't see the point, he doesn't see the point in going to school and trying hard. And he wants to go to university. He wants to do things in life. But what he's seen from us is that we're just constantly struggling for money. You know, we, we've tried to do everything right. Um we, we, we've, we've tried to bring them up the right way. You know, I, I went to university uh, when I was older to retrain, you know, get, go yeah. and get myself a decent job. We found that difficult. We've had to move away from our area, so I've taken them away from from family. And he's seen all these things, and he's he's quite politically astute as well. He's, he's, you know, he's a bright enough lad. Sure. Um, I mean, nobody calls their children, so everyone says about their kids, don't they? But, uh, um, a lot of aristocrats don't, but, uh, but well, that's a like, different well, phone-in. <laughs> Um, but um, he 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 sees the world around him, and he's kind of like thinking, "We're going. I'm going to struggle to keep a roof over my head." You're talking about yeah. a breach in the social contract, aren't you? Really, you're talking yeah, about a generation yeah. that's watching their parents keep their side of the bargain, but be let down by the people at the other end of the contract, whether it's government or society or economy. Well, what is the point of me playing by the rules and doing my bit? Because the rewards that traditionally come in as a response to that no longer come in as a response to that yeah yeah you know that's that's and and this is what he's seeing now the thing is is he gets a lot of his politics from social media as well Mm. and i don't know whether that's been amplified um i I don't know whether he's just feeling that that sort of that hopelessness from that side of things as well um but there is another element in that he's had a, to, to sort of pivot it a little bit again, is it, he's had a horrendous time you know, when he was younger through right. social media. We, we made mistakes. Um, well, it, so you yeah. don't know what to do now. And, and I, 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 I guess I sense what you're alluding to. You mean being unaware of some of the threats online because the technology was so new and you, you, you thought he was safe in his room when... Of course, yeah. uh, people with very um, unpleasant motives would have access to, 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 to children. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I'm looking at the Finland thing and, and thinking, because you're right, and it's going to be very hard, and I, and I don't know whether this might be pertinent to your own mental health as well. It's very hard to convince kids that it's worth doing X, Y, and Z in expectation of rewards A, B, and C, because that social contract at the moment is creaking under under the pressure of reality, whether it's, you know, job security, whether it's home ownership, whether it's job satisfaction. But the but the Finnish model points to nature and it points to finding other ways of of deriving fulfillment and deriving happiness. And and you know, I know it sounds simplistic, but getting into clubs and getting into social interaction and get they're not mutually exclusive i know you thought and you were in a way coming at it from a different angle but i'm not sure it's that different at all i I think that that causal relationship you're describing is chicken and egg part of the reason why he's struggling with the big questions that he's struggling with is because he's not building the 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 face-to-face social connections and the and the and the interactions and the experiences outside of his own head that would make his own head a happier place to be barry I think I think that's true, and I think you know, that, like I say, I, 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 I know it's a slightly different way, but you, you're right. It, it's it's a wide, it's kind of widening the picture a little bit. I think that, that you know, doing a bit, but yeah, I think that, that there are two sides to it: social media yes. and the the accessibility of everything is keeping him in his room and is keeping him in his defined areas. 
and the more he's in that defined area, the, the more worse he's it gets. reminded of the situation that he's in. Yeah, yeah. the worse it gets. Yeah. So your job, yeah. it, it, and I'm going to read you a couple of messages that have come in, actually, um, it, uh, today from, from parents. I'm going to read them to you, Barry, and I'm going to leave you to reflect upon what you're going to do next. So we'll start with Victoria, who's in West Berkshire. She said, thank you for today's programme about person-to-person contact. I really needed to hear it and all of the other views expressed. I'm the mum to two boys, aged 13 and 16, who are pushing for more freedom on screen, and I've been thinking that maybe our restrictions are too harsh. I'm going to stick to my guns and continue to encourage them to have more balance and pursue other hobbies and interests and meet up with friends in person too. Thank you again. And then even more powerfully, perhaps, Helen in Edinburgh writes, James, I have a 16-year-old with terrible anxiety and a 14-year-old who is on that trajectory also. You have changed my life today. I've just told my husband to listen back because we have to change everything. And we will do so because we have to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And that, if I was in the situation you're in, Barry, would be my takeaway from today's show is that I, you, we, this isn't going to fix itself and you know mental health is a complicated and a, and, a, and a crazy thing but there are things that we can do as parents to make things some things better and easier for our children and we are just not doing them and we have to definitely definitely that's it good luck mate seriously thank you. no thank you and, and thank you everybody who sent messages similar to the one from helen and the and the one from Victoria, it's extraordinary when you think about it, that, that we just have done that utter, utter reversal of what used to be normal. So our parents thought that we were perfectly safe when we were in. <laughs> or we think our children are safe when they're in and we're paranoid about when they're out, when really it should be the other way around. How remarkable. It's 11.47, PMQ's on the way. It's 11.52. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. PMQs is imminent. Have we paged Natasha Clark? Is Natasha on, on her way to talk us through what is likely to unfold? Before that, um, I don't know if I've got time on this, but we'll be coming back to it, Ethan and, and Chris and everyone else waiting to talk about this. We've just changed our view entirely on the uh, on one of the major issues of the moment. But I want to take a moment to talk to you about asylum seekers. And this is really important. I never know when, you know, if, if I now use the word gammon, if I start talking about the gammon in your life, by which I, going a long and rich tradition going all the way back to Charles Dickens, uh, it refers to a, a set of opinions combined with a level of stubbornness. That's what we mean by the word. Lots of racists like to pretend that gammon is a racist term, but um, enough, enough about them. It, it is a description of very stubborn ignorance, okay, but I never know how stubborn that ignorance is. So when I talk about the gammon in your life and I say this is important, I mean that you might be able to help them. Because the conversation about asylum seekers being put up in hotels has been one of the most irresponsible and obnoxious and potentially dangerous conversations that I can remember the country having. It's not something we've done a lot on the programme. But what we have done is call it absolutely correctly in a way that has been proved on a scale that even I can't quite believe. So what happened was that people like, didn't Farage start going there with his Fisher-Price binoculars and start filming stuff? And what you do, okay, is that you find a building that used to be a three-star or a four-star hotel, okay? Maybe it was even a three-star or a four-star hotel last week and it was still open. But you find a building like that and the Home Office moves asylum seekers into that building. And at precisely that point, it ceases to be a three-star or a four-star hotel. The, the facilities, the services, the food, the staff, every single thing that contributed to, to it being a hotel, never mind a three-star or a four-star hotel, it's all gone. The number of people to a room, the, 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 the food that you eat for breakfast, there's no menus. You're not getting chicken Kiev for your dinner if you don't, or, or a steak or a choice. So that to me was always so obvious that it didn't even need explaining. And that's why I'm never quite sure how stubborn the ignorance is of the kind of people who profess to be furious about asylum seekers being put up in luxury hotels. Now, someone like Farage knows that they're not being. But his entire career depends upon making people believe things about foreigners that are not true, 
whether it's the people who sit in the European Parliament or whether it's the people staying in the former hotel in the middle of your town because they are not hotels. And the reason why the Home Office has put people in these buildings is because it was the most cost-effective way to accommodate them while their applications were processed. Now, if they knew what they were doing, if they hadn't spent 14 years conducting ludicrous austerity uh, programmes and culture wars and the nonsense of Brexit, if they'd actually been prioritising the state of the country, they'd be processing these applications much quicker. That too would save money. But the bottom line on asylum seeker accommodation would have always been that the Home Office was trying to do it in the most cost-effective way possible. It will still be expensive in comparative and relative terms, but it would be cheaper than any other alternative because these buildings are already purposed for accommodating people. They are no longer four-star hotels. They are now asylum accommodation centres. But guess what? Some of them have still got the sign outside, which means Billy Buncher numbers can go on Twitter with his bulldog avatar and issue a call to arms. There have been imprisonments. There's been jailings this week of people who turned up outside asylum accommodation centres labouring under the illusion that the conditions inside were comparable to luxury hotels. That's what I mean about stubborn ignorance. There might be someone in your life who believes this, and what I'm giving you now are the tools to explain to them why they are wrong and just how spectacularly wrong they are. Because it's, um, it's a cancerous opinion to hold. It will eat you from the inside. And what has emerged today is something that it should be shocking, but if you understand the issue, isn't. Because the government, extraordinarily, the government, I don't think, punted the propaganda. The government fell for the propaganda. So members of the Conservative Party, senior members of the uh, governing party, up to and including prime ministers, fell for the Faragist propaganda about luxury hotels. They fell for the lie that these buildings were still offering up saunas and and five-course breakfasts and uh, a choice of pillows for everybody who's come here in a small boat from continental Europe. Because guess what's come out today? Rishi Sunak's plan to save public money by moving asylum seekers out of hotels is in tatters after Whitehall's own spending watchdog disclosed that the government's alternative sites will cost millions of pounds more. Why? Because the Bibby bloody Stockholm wasn't operating as a human accommodation centre last week. And the hotels were. So even calling them hotels has created this problem. A £1.2 billion problem, £46 million more, more than where they were before. So by the end of March, the Home Office expects to have spent at least 230 million quid, 230 million quid developing the barge in Portland, an RAF base in Lincolnshire, another one in Essex and an ex-student hall of residence in Huddersfield. Now, why do they need to change the ex-student hall of residence in Huddersfield to accommodate asylum seekers? Because it will be even less accommodating than it was before. And that's the end of my TED Talk. So don't fall for this crud next time some rabble-rousing racist serves it up for you, whether they're a politician or a presenter. It's absolute rollocks. And, And it's infected the highest level of government to the point where they've introduced policies because they honestly believed they were going to save money and they've ended up spending more stubborn ignorance and uh and there it is it is coming up to 12 o'clock natasha clark is here pmqs is on the way there isn't a great deal of time available because <laughs> i just went on a little bit of an unscheduled rant little. but what was might what might what might we expect to pop up in pmqs today well i, w- I wonder if Keir Starmer might want to make this argument in Prime Minister's questions that this um, this Rwanda policy, because obviously Rwanda is going back to the House of Lords today. We will hopefully um, hear from them in a few hours about whether they will put down some more amendments to try and change it, whether Keir Starmer will um, talk about this report, which says that those asylum proposals are costing more than the hotels they were taking them out of. Um, is probably, I think, quite a strong argument for Keir Starmer to make. And the government do like to talk about how much money the government have, they say, wasted on the Rwanda policy. Mm. So it ties quite nicely into a Labour narrative. So I wouldn't be surprised if he were to raise mm. that one. Um, 
And obviously we've had in the last sort of 24 hours yet another election um, hint from Jeremy Hunt. The uh, Chancellor said yesterday that it could be October. I wonder if Keir Starmer will repeat his call for the Prime Minister to call to a general election now. He's obviously quite keen to get into office and get into power as soon as possible. So, of course, he will want the election as soon as possible. The other thing that I'm looking at this week is the crisis in our prisons. I wonder if... Um, Keir Starmer might want to ask the Prime Minister whether it is true that he is delaying the um, new sentencing bill because of a possible another Tory rebellion on prisons. Apparently 42 backbench Tory MPs have signed another amendment which would force mandatory two-year prison sentences for any repeat offenders. Now, that's something that we just do not have enough space for in our prisons, isn't it? Uh, Well, and the right-wing Tories are complaining about plans to reduce sentences or or, or, or cut so yes, th- this th- new sentencing they, they will bill would do so. Around. What I don't know if you describe, I don't know if you can describe Liz Truss as right wing. She's more chicken wing, isn't she, than, than, <laughs> than right wing? But, I like but, it. but she's become a focal point for the headbangers on the Tory bench. Yes, I'm not sure if she's signed this um, this amendment, but uh, yeah, it's it's got quite a lot of Tory support. I think 42 um, Tory MPs have signed this amendment, calling we for will stronger sentences. Cross immediately to the House of Commons as soon as Sir Keir Starmer gets to his feet. But um, I, I, I'm confident in the caliber of journalists that are reporting this now leo varadka the irish t shock is um it's reported as standing down both as as the prime minister or or, or the t shock and indeed as the leader of fina gael um uh, that's unexpected i know you know as mm. much about this as i do but it's fair to say no one saw this coming no i don't think anybody did i don't think anyone did see this coming especially because there's an there's an election happening in ireland i think this year as well it's quite unusual to to step down um, as the party's leader and obviously he has been in in power for a long time I think since 2017 but you know we weren't expecting this uh, a man very close to the European Union and obviously during Brexit negotiations caused our government quite a lot of headaches obviously over the border with Northern mm. Ireland um, and I'm sure that will be sort of how he will be remembered this side of the pond uh, anyway but yes a bit of a, sh- a bit of a shock news today. So the technicalities of it will be that he remains T-shock until Fine Gael elect a new leader or, or, or choose a new leader by the party I at which point so. the new leader becomes Prime Minister as well Yes yeah, so usually in the most constitutional including our own, you can't leave that post unfilled. So it'll be a, a bit like when and Theresa May said she was going to resign. Sir Keir Starmer. Uh, can I thank the Prime Minister for his words in welcoming Vaughan Gething to his post as First Minister of Wales. As the first black leader of any European government, it's a historic moment that speaks to the progress and values of modern-day Wales. Yeah. And I also pay tribute to Mark Drakeford for his long, steady service in Wales. Yeah. Mr Speaker... Violent prisoners released early because the Tories wrecked the criminal justice system. Three and a half thousand small boat arrivals already this year because the Tories lost control of the borders. The NHS struggling to see people because the Tories broke it. Millions paying more on their mortgages. A budget that hit pensioners. A £46 billion hole in his sums. Why is the Prime Minister so scared to call an election? Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, as I said in January, my working assumption is that the election will be in the second half of the year. But I must say, I thought that out of everybody, he'd actually be the most grateful, Mr Speaker, because he's now actually got time to come up with a plan for Britain. We're all all looking forward to finally seeing it. Uh, uh, We're ready. Just call it. Just call it. Mr Speaker, he talks, he talks a plan. Let's just take his Rwanda policy. When they first announced this gimmick, they claimed it would settle tens of thousands of people. The Home Office then whittled it down to a mere 300. Four times that number have already arrived this month, and the backlog stands at 130,000. Can the Prime Minister see any flaw in his plan to deport less than 1% of that backlog. Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, since I became Prime Minister, the number of small boat crossings are actually down by over a third, Mr Speaker. And that's because we've doubled national crime agency funding, we've increased the illegal enforcement rates by 70%, we've closed 7,500 bank accounts, deported 24,000 illegal migrants and processed over 112,000 cases, more than at any point in the last two decades, Mr Speaker. And it's crystal clear, as we're seeing from the Labour Party's opposition in this House, while we're committed to stopping the boats, the Labour Party would keep them coming. 
coming. The tragedy is we know the Prime Minister doesn't even believe in the Rwanda gimmick. He, He tried to stop funding it, but he's now so diminished that his entire focus is stopping his MPs holding the sword of Damocles above his head, perhaps even literally in the case of the Leader of the House. His his great hope is to persuade his party with a couple of empty planes, praying they won't notice when the flights stop going, the boats still coming and the costs keep mounting. How has he managed to spend? £600 million of taxpayer money on a gimmick to deport 300 people. Mr Speaker, it's it's crystal clear not only does the Labour Party not have a plan to fix this issue, but the truth is they don't actually care about fixing this issue. He talks about the gangs. When we gave the police new powers to crack down on the people smuggling gangs, he spent months campaigning and voting against it. Thanks to our new laws, thanks to our new laws, 900 criminals have been arrested. 450 have been convicted, serving over 370 years behind bars. If it was up to him, if it was up to him, those criminals would still be out on our streets, Mr. Speaker. And the truth is, if he, if the truth is, if he wasn't the Labour leader, he'd still want to be their lawyer. Speaker, I've prosecuted more people smugglers than he's had than he's had helicopter rides, and that's a lot. And this, I've done it. The Rwanda gimmick is going to cost the taxpayer two million pounds for every one of his three hundred people that they deport. And I know the Prime Minister likes to spend a lot on jet setting, but that's some plane ticket. <laughs> It's the cost of Tory chaos and it's working people who are paying the price. The man he made as immigration minister let the cat out of the bag when he said the Prime Minister's symbolic flights will not provide a credible deterrent. And we know the Prime Minister himself thought it wouldn't work. If the people selling this gimmick don't believe in it, why should the country? Mr Speaker, he's very keen to talk about who he prosecuted. He's a bit less keen to talk about when he defended his boot to rear, Mr Speaker. But when it, when, it comes, when it comes to this question, when it comes to this question of how to deal with people who are here illegally, his values are simply not those of the British people. After all, this is the person who campaigned to stop the deportation of foreign dangerous criminals, Mr Speaker. A dangerous criminal was jailed for dealing Class A drugs after he fought to keep him here. A gangmaster was convicted of carrying a knife after he fought to keep him here. So whether it's representing terrorists or campaigning for criminals, it's clear whose side he's on, and it's not the British people. It's genuinely sad to see him reduced to this nonsense. Let's take another example that I started with. After 14 years of Tory chaos in the prison system, the Justice Secretary have reduced to begging the Prime Minister either to send fewer offenders to prison or to release them even earlier. I must say I've got sympathy for anyone trying to get an answer out of the Prime Minister. So what's it going to be? Fewer criminals behind bars in the first place or more released early onto our streets? Which is it? Mr Speaker, thanks to our record and plan, violent crime, violent crime has fallen by 50%, Mr Speaker. We've recruited more police officers, given them more powers and kept serious offenders in prison for longer. What's his record? What's his record? He voted against greater protection for our emergency workers, opposed tougher sentences for violent criminals and failed to give police the powers they need. It would be back to square one with Labour, soft on crime and soft on criminals. You can see why he doesn't want an election. Why his party have lost faith in him. Why half his cabinet are lining up to replace him. No answers, no plan, no clue. And the Prime Minister 
has never had the courage to stand up to his party. So let me help him out and say to them what he wishes he could. The mortgage mayhem, the waiting list, the criminals walking free, they are the cost of Tory chaos. And if they can't bring themselves to stop the endless games and gimmicks, stop putting themselves before country, they should pack up, go home, and waste somebody else's time. It wasn't that difficult, was it, Prime Minister? Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, he talks... Prime Minister. <laughs> Mr Speaker, he, he talks about his ideas, but we're two weeks on from the budget. The Shadow Chancellor found time to make a one-hour speech last night, and we still, we still don't know how they're going to pay for their £28 billion black hole. But while he tries to talk down Britain and the progress that we are making, today's news shows that the plan is working. Inflation down, Mr Speaker. Energy bills down. Wages up, pensions up, and taxes cut by £900. And that is the choice. Higher taxes and back to square one with Labour, or tax cuts and real change with the Conservatives. The UK birth rate is falling while those requiring fertility treatment to conceive is rising. There are no employment rights attached to those undertaking fertility treatment, no paid time off work. Would the Prime Minister join me in encouraging employers, large and small, across the United Kingdom to sign up to the Fertility Workplace Pledge, mm -hmm. which I have launched with Fertility Matters at Work, LGBT Mummies, Fertility Network UK and many others to support those undertaking fertility when they're in work? Mm -hmm. Well, can I start by thanking my honourable friend for her excellent work campaigning on this issue. And she is right, employers should offer their staff understanding, support and flexibility whilst they're undergoing fertility treatment. And the best way to improve the experience of those undergoing treatment, both women and their partners, is through voluntary approaches. And that's why I would join her encouraging all companies to sign up to the Fertility Workplace Pledge. SNP leader Stephen Flynn. Mr Speaker, with his backbenchers looking for a unity candidate to replace him, which of the now numerous born again Thatcherites on the Labour front bench <laughs> does he believe best fits the bill? <laughs> well, Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, it, uh, and it, it, was, it, was, uh, it was surprising to hear all this talk about the 1970s uh, from the Shadow Chancellor in particular. But then if you see what's happening in places like Birmingham, where taxes are going up by 21 per cent, Mr Speaker, services are being cut, whether it's social care, children's services, or indeed the, in some streets literally the lights are being turned off. It was unsurprising why they're talking about the 70s, and I can just say what they've done to Birmingham, the Conservatives will never let them do to Britain. Of course, Mr Speaker, there's a serious point to be made here because the IFS have warned of the conspiracy of silence which exists between the Labour Party and the Conservative Party when it comes to £18 billion of looming public sector cuts. Indeed, just last night, they actually outlined that the fiscal rules of the Labour Party and the Conservative Party are in effect identical. So with such with such so with such continuity on offer, Mr Speaker, the public are right to be anti Westminster, aren't they? Well, Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, I well, I'm surprised to hear him quoting the uh, IFS because the IFS also described the recent SNP budget as, in their words, misleading, and said, and said that, and said in their words, that pain is almost certainly coming. It is a savage tax and tax budget, Mr. Speaker, a savage tax and tax budget. Because here's the reality of it. Whilst NHS spending in England is going up in real terms, in Scotland it is going down, Mr Speaker. And while taxes are being cut by the UK Government, it is the SNP Government that is putting them up. And that is the contrast. Where the SNP or indeed Labour are in charge, it's working people that pay the price. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister quite rightly often criticises. And the time is almost exactly quarter past twelve. Natasha and I will be going over what you have just heard shortly. Um, a couple of you asking me whether Diane Abbott is in the house. I don't, I don't, the short answer is I don't know, but I, but I don't think, given that the opening salvos of, of PMQs this week were not about her. I don't think that she will be necessarily as keen to speak this week as she was last week, but but I'll have a proper look while you listen to this. It is 18 minutes after 12, and um, I think if there were congratulations, then they would be issued now because you hit everything there, didn't you, pretty well, much, you, on uh, your predictions, <laughs> and uh, up to and including the, the conclusion with the call for a general election. As you did say... He did say quite a lot in his introduction <laughs> <She> <laughs> marks, didn't he? I'm going to play myself down now. Yeah, well, I don't know. Everything you mentioned came up. So yeah, you got a 100% prison tick, hit. general election tick, Rwanda tick. So, yeah, happy days to me. Um, yes, it was, um, I think Rishi had had some Weetabix this morning, hadn't he? Clearly been told to um, to give it a little bit more welly this time. This is obviously the last Prime Minister's questions before the Easter holidays, before MPs go and break up. And obviously he has a crucial test later today when he's going to face his own MPs in the 1922 committee. So this is really sort of part Part one of the Rishi fight back day. Stop plotting. <laughs> Rishi fight back number 73. Sure, exactly. Yeah, yeah, whichever number you'd like to say. But yeah, hitting, you know, back at what has happened over the weekend about the reports of plots, about the reports of people trying to oust him. He's got to come back and say something. This has been the first time he will be in front of his own MPs. So in a way, it's really for them more than it is for us today. Yeah. It's about Nicely a message put. that he's going to try and give them to say, look, I'm still up for the fight against Keir Starmer. And I think he, he did attempt that, but I thought, to be honest with you, I thought it was pretty poor from both sides today. I didn't feel vintage. either of them were <clears throat> It wasn't vintage. Stalmer had a very good joke about a sword of Damocles. That was very funny when mm. he was talking about Penny Morden, who obviously carried the sword um, at the King's coronation. So talking about the sword of Damocles and her um, holding it over his head. Um, like I say, like another re- reference to those reports over the weekend that it could be she who is plotting to replace the Prime Minister. However, I don't think that's um, very true for most of the MPs I've been speaking to this week. A lot of them sort of shrug their shoulders and go, eh? You wouldn't want to take over before the election, exactly. would you really? If, I mean, uh, unless your ambition was blind. Uh, uh, the, the challenge, it's a talk about a poison chalice. Exactly. Why on earth would you want to be Prime Minister for less time than Liz Truss was? And the, t- <laughs> and, and, the mem- and the the members, the MPs, would only want to propel somebody into that position if they felt it increased their own chances of retaining their seats at the next election. And it doesn't really feel as if there is any king across the water in that context. I don't think so. I think Penny Morden is quite popular with both Tory grassroots um support they seem to absolutely love her um and i think she probably does have a little bit more of an appeal uh, among the british public just mm. in terms of her sort of general demeanor i think she could appeal to probably more people than rishi sunak might be he's not as much of a people person i think as she is she's a better campaigner than he is i think that's is probably she? fair to say she, did, she came closer than people realized she didn't did. she? This is during the, the last go Yes, I can't remember exactly how many MPs she had, but it was within a whisker of, of Rishi Sunak in the end. It was, I can't, I can't remember exact numbers, I think within 20 to 30 MPs. If either of them had, had gone the other way, then then history could have been very, very different. So she was the, the runner-up, as it were, um, in that contest. Mm. So, um, you know, it all could have been very different. Um, so I think people are just naturally looking around who may be their saviour waiting in the wings. But like I say, I don't think really think there is one. So what, I, I, I mean, the prospect of PMQs being Groundhog Day for the next six months is quite real, isn't it? So Keir Starmer keeps pointing out things that aren't going terribly well. And Rishi Sunak keeps accusing the former lawyer Keir Starmer of having once been a lawyer. Yep, and also not having a plan. We've heard that one before and I'm sure we will hear that one again. You don't have a plan, Labour will take us back to square one. That's a, a line that they've clearly trotted out that clearly works with the focus groups. Yeah. Um, it would be nice for us well, journalists. You know, we say that every week. Bit. We say that every week. It clearly works with the focus groups. I don't they're, they're on twenty percent in the polls. Well, who are these focus true. groups that it works with? Yeah, they make a good point. Maybe they're not telling them the truth. Maybe the people have infested the focus groups. Maybe. They've kind of hijacked them because nobody's sitting there going, "Yeah, this is really great. You should do more of this." Because mm. if they were, they'd be going up in the polls, not mm-hmm. down. And the Prime Minister, you know, today had a bit of a better argument to talk about inflation, to talk about the economy starting to pick up, which is obviously the narrative that they want to, to start to talk about. But even it felt like he, um, you know, was on the back foot on, on that um, today after after Keir Starmer's questions about, you know, 
the dire state of things about Rwanda, about the amount of money that's being spent on um, not just hotels, but all forms of uh, asylum seeker accommodation, about the crisis in prisons. Um, Alex Chalk, the Justice Secretary's face was, uh, he was trying not to to, to show any emotion when um, Keir Starmer said to him, um, there's a report in today's time saying that he was, uh, one of his staff was told, which would you prefer, let prisoners out early um, or stop people going going to prison and stop people just letting people off at all. And that is going to become a really big problem for the Conservatives in the next couple of weeks and months because, as reports say, there's less than 200 places. They've got to do something and they don't want to bring this bill forward for some and, reason. And the backlog as well of cases waiting to come to court is exactly. still absolutely it's enormous as well. So it's a proper years. critical mass type scenario, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so what's his job tonight? What What is he... Because uh, he doesn't have to address the 22. Presumably someone's had a word in his ear and said, I think think you should talk to the troops prime minister what what what's his job what will he be trying to do just to sort of tell everyone to stop picking on me or well it will so they they will argue it's a scheduled meeting and he does usually have these meetings does with the 22 at the okay. start and end of term so they'll probably go this has always been in the diary for a long time it's not in response okay. to the weekend's events that's what they'll say um he has to convince them that he's the guy and to, to stop trying to plot to oust him that is really well, what are you hearing are, are there plots to oust him because we seem to be do you know that really strange thing so i don't really care about any of it do you hand on heart. i do care no, yeah. I'm really inter- I mean, i'm you interested. can't say no because you're the political no, editor, I am but, interested. but normally into nissan warfare and, and it, normally it's quite riveting and engaging but with this lot this one isn't i think because yeah. everybody realized that it wasn't true okay. quite instantly i think everybody realized that penny morden was not about to try and stab rishi sunak in the back and everybody okay. started therefore to go okay who is putting about this briefing and it wasn't just one or two people it was a few mps a few oh, mischievous okay. mps putting right. about this what I think the aim was to do was probably more to destabilise Penny Morden as a potential leadership rival. So oh. my eyes would really be on some of the other potential leadership oh, rivals. Oh, rather okay. You've than made that. it interesting. There That's you go. That's extraordinary. You've just literally made me think, also, oh, who's actually... Who's, 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 who else? Come on, who else wants to be Tory leader? Someone's trying to tarnish Penny Morden. Ahead of the game. Uh, the most obvious contender for that position would be Kemi Badenoch. You who, might think who, so. Whose ambition the... seems to be um, dwarfed only by her... Um, uh, what was perhaps a nice way of putting it? Insensitivity. Insensitivity. I'd say it's the opposite. She's a very sensitive human being, isn't yeah, she? Well, um, but yes, it, is it her? Is it her team briefing against Penny Mordaunt? Is it you know other people that might want to be Conservative Party leader? Suella Braverman might want to be Conservative Party leader as well. Is it just a bit of mischief being cooked up? Look, like I said last week, it's fair to say that the mood in the Conservative Party has really take, really gone off a cliff in the last week or two. The way that they handled the Frank Hester row, being sent out on the airwaves to defend what yeah. many people say was the indefensible, only for Kemi Bader not to put up that tweet and cause the whole government to go into absolute chaos well, and change the line. And then to disown it I'm with Nick Ferrari. Exactly, and, and then to row back later, again and say, actually, bizarre. we shouldn't give back the cash. So, you know, it's, it's a row that has continued to rumble on for them. Um, and I don't think anybody's impressed with the way that they've handled this situation. Situation. Um, obviously, you know, the government trying to come back saying, oh, we've got our smoking ban to come forward. It's not enthusing Tory MPs. They're going, OK, sure. Yeah, Give great. me something else I can well sell done. on the doorstep. It's not going to be winning me votes. Do you know why it's not a vote winner, that? Because so few people smoke. So if they were, I mean, oddly, if, they, if loads of people still smoked, then there'd be a lot more uproar about it, a lot more unhappiness, because they'd be like, how dare you take away my fags? Mm-hmm. That's terrible. Or, or my, uh, But because there's not, no one's life is going to change at all. It's a really, it's good policy. I like it. It's, I think it's great for the country, great for the future, but it's not going to change anything in the short term. So it's not something mm-hmm. you can hang your hat on as a, as a policy offer. It's strange. Would you like to have a little listen to Leo Varadkar's um, closing words as leader of Fine Gael. I think we should. Just in the last few minutes, he's been addressing the media in Ireland. My reasons for stepping down are both personal and political. I believe this government can be re-elected and I believe my party, Fine Gael, can gain seats in the next stall. Most of all, I believe the re-election of this three-party government would be the right thing for the future of our country, continuing to take us forward protecting all that's been achieved and building on it. But after careful consideration and some soul searching, I believe that a new Taoiseach and a new leader will be better placed than me to achieve that. To renew and strengthen the team, to focus our message and policies, to drive implementation. And after seven years in office, I don't feel I'm the best person for that job anymore. There are loyal colleagues and good friends contesting local European elections and I want to give them the best chance possible. 
and I think they have a better chance under a new leader. I am standing aside in the absolute confidence that the country and the economy are in a good place and that my colleagues in government from all three parties, Fine Gael, Fianna Fáil and the Greens and the Oireachtas, will continue to work hard for the nation's best interests. On a personal level, I've enjoyed being Taoiseach, leader and a cabinet member since March 2011. I've learned so much about so many things, met so many people who I'd never got to meet, been to places I would never have seen, both home and abroad. And I am deeply grateful for it. And despite the challenges, would wholeheartedly recommend a career in politics to anyone who's considering it. However, politicians are human beings and we have our limitations. We give it everything until we can't anymore, and then we have to move on. I will, of course, continue to fulfill my duties as Taoiseach until a new one is elected and will remain as consistency TD for Dublin West. I know inevitably there will be speculation as to the quote-unquote real reason for my decision. These are the real reasons. That's it. I have nothing else lined up. I have nothing in mind. I have no definite personal or political plans. But I'm really looking forward to having the time to think about them. Oh, it's quite emotional at the end there. Yeah, he definitely, you could hear the cracking in his voice there, I think. He Very appeared human. a bit emotional. He's just um, run out of the road by the sounds of it. Seven years. Yeah. And two, I think he's been he's been Taoiseach and they've switched around that position right. a few times, haven't yes. they, um, in Ireland. He was, um, he, did he do two years and then Michael Martin did two years and I think then he came back. So yes, it is a long time to be at the top of, of any political um, party and, and to be leading and what's obviously been a bit of a turbulent time for, for Ireland throughout the Brexit negotiations for us, but also on the world stage, um, you know, that's fair enough. He, he, like I say, he sounded like he, he is, he says... Touch of the sturgeons, perhaps, although she may well, have had a little bit more going on well, behind the scenes. I don't think we're going to see a white tent erected outside Leo Varadkar's house anytime soon. Oh, never say never with well, the politicians I guess, I guess these not. days. But eh? that sense of it being a surprise and it being a, a, a very personal decision. We not, were always not, all surprised at sturgeon too, weren't we? We were indeed. Thank you, Natasha. Um, I've got quite an important story for you next, that Joel Hill's the business and economic editor at ITV News has been squirrelling away at. Do you remember when P&O sacked loads of people in uh, contravention of the law and even Conservative MPs were up in arms? I'm sure Grant Shapps vowed vengeance, although he might claim it was Sebastian Falk. Grant Shapps vowed vengeance. Well, Joel is one of the few journalists who's been keeping a close eye on what P&O have been doing in the aftermath, and I think you're going to be as, um, as surprised as I was. We'll catch up with that after the very latest news headlines with Amelia Cox. It is 12.34 and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC, where we turn our attention next to a story. Well, I'll, I'll let Joel Hills remind you of the, the original story, but you will probably remember that the political establishment was united in outrage at the actions of the shipping company P&O when it emerged. Well, I, I said I'd let Joel Hills explain, and Joel is here now, the business and economics editor at ITV News, who's been looking into this story and some um, interesting new developments in France. Joel, take us back to the very beginning, if you would. Yeah, this is a story, James, and I bet your viewers will remember this. It's a story about long hours. It's a story about low pay, very low pay. You all viewers will remember back in March 22, 2022, so two years ago, P&O abruptly sacked without warning just under 800 of its seafarers. Now, at the time, P&O said it absolutely had to do this. The, ver the company's on the verge of bankruptcy and it needed to urgently cut its costs. The, uh, it did admit later that it had also broken the law because it yeah. failed to consult the unions at the time, but said it had to do this out of absolute necessity. And this is about the, the men and the women who work on board ships, who get your car on and off the ferry, who serve your food and drink, who keep the public areas of the ship clean and tidy. And it's also about the men and women who are trained to, in extremis, if the worst case scenario happens and there's an accident at sea, they're trained to get you off the ship safely. So what p &O did is it replaced its crews with agency workers from overseas, from very far-flung places and countries in the world, like India, the Philippines, Indonesia, Honduras, Mauritius, Malaysia. And it told MPs at the time that it planned to pay them an average hourly rate of £5.50 an hour, which is obviously much lower than the UK minimum wage of £10.40. Now, P&O 
at the time said the lowest hourly rate was £5.15. But ITV News, James and The Guardian have seen recent contracts, contracts and payslips, which suggest that actually P&O has been paying some crew even less than that. We spoke to crew on board the vessels. Uh, they routinely work 12-hour shifts, they told us, seven days a week for up to 17 weeks. That's four months at a time without a day off and without permission to leave the ship. Perhaps unsurprisingly, many of them also said they're exhausted. But James, they also said the rates of pay on offer at P&O, which I think many of your viewers will find shocking, were actually better than those on our other international cruise or cargo ships. So they actually oh. valued the job. Which puts it in a strange moral place, doesn't it? Because you're you're sharing a story that will shock many people listening, and yet the victims, if you like, of the practice that you're reporting and describing are are not exactly up in arms about it. No, they're not. And and P and O, let's be clear, uh, is not doing anything legally wrong. The company spotted a gap in the law, which was never intended, which means it is uh -huh. not required to pay the minimum wage to seafarers who work on foreign registered ships, which ships are registered in Cyprus, that sail in international waters and are employed by agencies outside the UK. Grant Chaps and the governments on both sides of the channel were outraged at the time it sacked its seafarers and replaced them. And it, they both promised to compel the company to pay the minimum wage. The Seafarers Wages Act has become law in the UK. The secondary legislation will be laid in the summer. And I'm in Paris because the uh, French government has yesterday signed a decree which it, uh, basically means that from today in, or from yesterday yeah. in theory all ferry operators will have to pay the minimum wage will have to limit the days crews can work to two consecutive weeks and if they fail to do that in three months time they've got an implementation period to comply uh, there will be sanctions in the forms of fines and in extremists executives could go to prison um I, I, I just want to clarify, because people may think that we're talking about ships that are sailing around the, 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 the locales and the countries from which the staff hail, but th these are Dover to Calais crossings that we're describing, and they, and they happen all day, every day. Absolutely right, and they, they happen non-stop all day, every day, and they are, you know, P&O has three ships that sail between Dover and Calais, they're carrying tourist traffic, particularly as we go to East, Easter and the the high summer, and every day of the week they're carrying the freight, which brings the, the goods that we consume every day in and out of the UK. So, no, this is absolutely one of the world's busiest shipping lanes. This matters uh, very, very greatly. I mean, we should say, James, that P&O would dispute quite a lot of what I'm saying. It okay. insists that it, no one, none of its crew earn less than £5.20 an hour. They do say that their crew are well rested uh, and that they look after their welfare, their well-being and their mental health. And they also say they're going to comply with, and they always comply with minimum wage uh, legislation required nationally and internationally, but they haven't yet responded formally to what the French government announced yesterday. Uh, which which could be a, a, a proper game changer. Uh, uh, and have I understood you correctly? Because I know Grant Shapps, when he was Transport Minister, described them as uh, operating like pirates of the high seas. But they, they've been slow, but not they haven't abandoned this cause. So the legislation is in the pipeline for this country, but is already been enacted in France. That's correct. Uh, the, the legal loophole that P&O exploited is slowly closing. closing. That's the Maritime um, Labour Convention laws, I think, is it? Th th this is what the, 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 Fra the French government, has, yes. the law that they've just passed, is the anti-social, the company against anti-social dumping in the English Channel law. It's snappily titled. Well, we're all I mean, against it's a law that. <laughs> but what was interesting is that yesterday, France's maritime minister, a man called Hervé Belleville, uh, said that asking crew to work for 17 weeks without a day off was dangerous and immoral. Yeah. As he put it, James, how can you work non-stop for two months and be in full command of what you're doing? I mean, if P&O were here, though, they would say, look, our ships are perfectly safe and everything we do is aimed and directed at making sure crews are well rested. Um, you'll like this. Steve's been in touch while you've been speaking to say, as one of the 784 unlawfully sacked by P&O two years ago, I am shocked, in capital letters, shocked, I tell you, to hear what they are up to now. Um, and, I mean, that's the point, really, isn't it? That this is the importing 
almost of a foreign economy. It's, it's, it's wages that are acceptable to people who are never going to be living in Britain or in France. And, and uh, I, the, the, it's a question next of appetite, of whether or not £7,400 fines per crew member involved still looks like good business to P&O, because we all remember that interview where, where one of their executives essentially said, yes, we, ha- we, we have broken the law, but it's worth it in the great scheme yes, of things. Yes, Dave, uh, absolutely right. And we should also remember, James, that actually seen in purely business terms, this decision to sack the staff and replace them with agency crew has been a huge commercial success. Yeah. P&O's competitors say that by, you know, by cutting its wage bill, it's enabled the company to undercut them on price. On that Dover-Calais route, B&O is winning customers from DFDS, a ferry operator which does pay the minimum wage, from Eurotunnel, the operator yeah. which does pay the minimum wage. Brittany Ferries, yesterday I spoke to their president, and he told me unless politicians respond, his company would either disappear or have to copy P&O by sim- you know, uh, pursuing the a same similar, sort of thing. Similar, exactly the same thing, something which he said he was not prepared to do. The bottom line here, James, is that P&O knew that when it sacked its staff two years ago, there would be outrage, but it gambled that the shock and the anger would fade. And today, bookings are up, yeah. its costs has been, have been cut, and that gamble appears so far to have paid off. Uh, well, uh, you went undercover, did you, on one of the boats, or, 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 or are you too easily recognisable? You had to deploy some patsies. No, no not me. Not, uh, definitely not patsies. My a very able and brilliant uh, uh, colleague uh, went undercover. Uh, well, he posed as a, as as a, a passenger, passenger yes. uh, and he, he engaged in conversations uh, with staff. And and they they told us well, well staff with agency crews that yeah. they they shared information. Obviously, we are bending over backwards to protect their identities for, for obvious reasons but but no they, they they were happy to share their experience of working what it's like to work on board a P&O ferry and the hours are extremely long the rates of pay are rates that no one in Britain I suspect would accept or no one in Britain mm. would be legally allowed to accept if they uh, if they were working on shore but which uh, P&O insists have absolutely saved the business a oh, cracking story. Um, how are you getting back yourself? Are you coming back on a boat or are you catching the train? We're, we're catching the train. We're go. speeding towards London, hopefully, before too long. Well, good luck and bon voyage and, and, and do take care. The situation on the railways back on this side of the English Channel is far from, uh, far from enviable. Jo- Joel Hill's there, the business and economics editor at ITV News, um, bringing you up to date with a story that everybody insisted. They united, didn't they, the politicians, in saying something must be done. And, uh, well, in France, something has been done. But on this side of the channel, uh, things seem to be moving a little more slowly. It reminds me, and this will probably sound a bit weird to you, of what we said about social media at about half past 11 today, is that these companies will not do anything unless they are required to do so with either the threat of jail or financial penalty. So they find a loophole under which they can pay people. They can sack all the British workers who were on proper salaries and had union representation, just sack them illegally in contravention of employment law because it works out as, as, a, as a financial calculation, even to absorb whatever punishments are put in place for that. They save more by hiring this army of agency workers on a fraction of the wage that, that would be legally required in this country. Um, and then the only way you can get them to start observing employment or wage legislation is to either threaten them with fines or, as Joel said, to, to send them to jail, which is exactly what we said about um, social media companies. They're never going to do it for reasons of humanity or, or, or otherwise. And I should just stress again that, that Joel was um, reminding us throughout that P&O will and indeed do dispute some of the detail in his reports. It is 12.45. It is 10 to 1, and you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. If you're just uh, joining us, uh, I suppose the big news of the day happened on the other side of the sea. It was uh, um, uh, Leo Varadkar stepping down as, as leader of Fine Gael, which of course means that Ireland will have a new prime minister by, I suppose, the middle of April, quite possibly. But back in Blighty, I, I mean, I, I can ask you a question that you probably won't answer, Henry Riley, because you're a scrupulously impartial professional journalist and not a gob on a stick like me. Outside of work, yes. In as you are, you're a bit of a man about Putney, I'm told. Well, you, you, yeah, you're, you're kind of a bit of a roué. Pretty big over there. Yeah, yeah pretty big in Putney. Yeah. Have you ever heard anybody anywhere talking about Rwanda outside work, journalism, and politics? 
No. No, nor have I. And yet here we are again. I oh, know, here we go. <laughs> um, this is the start of ping pong this week, James, which is a phrase, again, pretty Westminster bubbly, so I'll try and unpack it. This is the to and fro, essentially, with how they pass controversial pieces of legislation. It starts in the Commons, goes to the Lords, they try and amend it slightly, then goes back to the House of Commons. Now, we saw the first iteration of that on Monday, where there were 10 amendments from the House of Lords, 10 changes, went back to the Commons, and MPs overturned all 10 of them, rather the government did. Now we're back to sort of square one with regards to that. It's gone back to the Lords. Likely there will be some further changes. So the the tally sort of um, dissipates every time. So this time, likely five or six proposed changes. We won't know till later this afternoon. The debate starts at around four o'clock. And as part of that ping pong, if they are voted through by the Lords, it will then go back, of course, to MPs to have their say. The difference with this is that... Firstly, in the House of Lords, there's a high representation of Liberal Democrats, Labour peers and also crossbench peers who are not attached to a political party but have expressed concerns about this. And similarly, Conservatives in the House of Lords who were bitterly opposed to the plans, one of whom is Lord Deben, formerly John Gummer, the Mm. party chairman under Margaret Thatcher. And he spoke with LBC's Andrew Marr on Monday. Well, the government has said that Rwanda will be safe but isn't safe at the moment. They're asking me to vote that it is safe. And I've never told a public lie in all the years, 16 years of being a minister. I'm not going to tell one now. Uh, It may well be safe in the future, but it's the courts that have to decide whether it will be safe. He puts it like that. And and, I mean, it's a relatively simple issue because he's just right. Mm. Well, and people from his wing of the Conservative Party certainly argue that, and indeed heavy hitters. Lord Clark, also yeah. one of those peers who's who's argued similarly. Um, what's interesting here, James, is earlier in the week, Rishi Sunak promised still, maintained that commitment to have flights taking off by the spring. Today is the 20th of March, so it is the first day of spring today. Um, and we, is that technical, Tom? Is it, is I think it, technically, is it yes. 20th of what? The, well, 20th of March this year was, was the, is the predicted start of spring. Says who? Well, I was looking on... Who are the sources? Well, I was looking, I think the Met Office... Spring is sprung. (laughs) Breaking news, spring is sprung. Well, the Met Office seemed to suggest it was today until until roughly the 20th of... uh, New one on me, I didn't realise that. I didn't know (laughs) they could... But you just thought it would be more significant, like April the 1st or 20th of March. Yeah, it seems a bit meh. bit throwaway, isn't isn't it? it? Is it three days Uh, after Paddy's Day? Is that how they calculate? I don't know how they calculate. Well, anyway, (laughs) spring is sprung. A few days off. Um, That then lasts, uh, uh, obviously, for a few months, so technically... How many? When does it end? Why, I read... Don't 20th of June. Half a story. 20th, 20th of June. And that becomes summer. But then people view early June as summer as well, don't oh, they? So it all gets Lord, a bit sort of lost in the weeds. It? But anyway, there's still a bit of leeway for Rishi Sunak to have that first flight taking off um, to Rwanda. Another issue, though, James, is the scheduling. So MPs leave for recess from Tuesday, return on the 15th of April. So mm. there's, a, there's a bit of a gap there whereby they can actually get this bill passed, let alone flights off the ground. Um, if it does pass today, then that's fine. It's all done and dusted. But But next week, there are two business days, which the government currently are not using. Now, people are questioning, indeed, some Conservative MPs are questioning, why are the government not using that? The suspicion is they're using this as part of a sort of wedge issue to trap Labour. And so the longer this goes on, the closer to an election. If they can delay those flights, then it looks better for them. Also, James, what's interesting is the Home Office. Sources at the Home Office are suggesting that it would actually take eight weeks from the bill passing to operationalise flights to Rwanda. So, again, the closer this can come to an election, uh, the better for the Conservatives. Right. Uh, Well, they think. They They, they, they hope, indeed. They hope. Because, I mean... I suppose a, a plane taking off, will, Sue Ada Baverman would be very delighted. It's her dream to see it on the front page mm. of the Daily Telegraph. But you're looking at a, a, a percentage of a percentage of the overall backlog or, or, or the overall total. And Labour will go immediately in on how much each individual deportation has cost. Well, Neil Coyle said in the House of Commons Labour MP earlier this week that actually it costs the same amount as sending six people to space on Virgin Galactic. That's having a great one, point. It's I a great point. kind of analogies. Um, it's always why we always measure things in double-decker buses yeah. in 1990s tabloids when I started my career. <laughs> uh, or swimming pools. We always measure things in swimming pools and now we measure them in space missions. How many people can you send to space? Uh, it was Speaking of space, mm. well, not really. It was the vernal equinox. That's what's happened. 
Spring. The oh, spring. Yeah. Oh, is that what that yeah, is? Yeah, right. The vernal equinox. I think it was at three o'clock this morning. Three o'clock. Oh, so I was right. You're absolutely oh, okay, right. Okay, great. Technically oh. right. Historically right. Do you, I don't know what it is. Don't ask me what it is. It's the vernal, ex, the vernal equinox. Stupid. Um, do you know? I like this because Henry's very young. Oh, uh, no. Do you know why? What John Gummer was? John Selwyn Gummer before he became Baron Devon. Do you know what he was best known for back in the day? No. You have no idea at all. I actually don't. Is Let that me bad? just check with my other youthful colleagues. Because for somebody my age, he, his name is synonymous oh. with feeding his four-year-old daughter Cordelia a beef burger to prove that Matt, there was no such thing as mad cow disease. Oh, or, he's or, environment or, or, secretary. Or that British beef was perfectly safe. So his poor little girl... Had to, on telly, had to eat... Sheila will remember this. She had to eat a beef burger, didn't she? To she prove that, that, um, that the beef was safe. She's got three heads now. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I mean, so that when he refers to having always told the truth... <laughs> When he, when he was a minister, he is—he, you know—he he was prepared to put. Well, I say to put his money where his mouth is. He was prepared to put his daughter's money where her mouth was. To be, to be quite literal about it. Um, so, it is what? What would you say then, if you were a betting man, which you're not? Is it, are we going to see a plane in the sky? Well, there's a three line in terms of the immediate. There's a three line whip tonight for all Conservative peers to attend. The issue is a lot of them haven't attended the uh, sort of House of Lords for some time, so they're going to have to do a sort of whip round and you know, give them a, a call to get them all going. Um, I don't suggest in the spring. No, I would if I was a betting man, I would suggest not because of that eight week delay between yeah. it being operational and planes taking off. And the question of whether anybody ever hears anyone talking about Rwanda deportations outside of the, the Westminster bubble, the, the, the media, and I suppose some of the uh, less pleasant corners of social media remains moot. Henry Riley, many thanks indeed. It is just coming. I've got 90 seconds of the show left and nothing to fill it with. Do you, have you got anything, anything you want to get off your chest? <laughs> Do a tryout for people who haven't heard you present a show Oh, no, yet. I'm not doing... No, no, no. I can't give a present a show in 90 seconds. No, but you could give people a taster. <laughs> no, I can't sort of like a... Trail not me, trail me. I can't yeah, do it in the presence me. of James O'Brien right. and well, Sheila you know, Fogarty. People, you, get, you get, you know, Henry is now working his way up the roster, the presenting roster. I Personally, yeah. I believe one day he'll, he'll be sitting at the very top of it. And, and some people oh, might oh, have... I don't, I don't feel very well. I think, yeah. <laughs> I think you're going to have to step in. Oh, me no too. No problem. Oh, right, too. Oh, oh. Um, oh, I'm, it's I've mean, gone all it's shy mean, on the radio, which is mean. not which is not what I'm supposed to do. I You're very think. good. Thank you. Um, uh, yes, it is indeed the Vernal Equinox. Thank you to everybody who has pointed <laughs> that out. I didn't I didn't get Badenoch and Braverman mixed up, but I don't think Braverman said she was dreaming of the. Uh, yes, of the, yeah. She told the Telegraph that she yeah. was dreaming of a, a her dream would be to see a flight take off. And uh, and of course, and here you go. Kyle doesn't need you to be selling yourself. He says, I, as a night worker, I already know that Henry. Oh, that's cool. Henry is brilliant. So there you He's go. He's the one. There you have it. Um, it is coming up to 12.59 and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I'll just read you this uh, from John before I go. He says, I think the subject matter of James O'Brien's phone-in today about social media and young people is so important that the whole world should be listening to it. There are friends and college colleagues that I would really want to hear it. And is there any way of getting a recording or a transcript of this morning? You can always uh, listen to everything. You can uh, catch up on Global Player, the official LBC app, where you can also pause and rewind live radio. You can also find it these days on YouTube in glorious Technicolor, although not until shortly after we finished. Uh, so download the Global Player for free from your app store or head to globalplayer.com. Coming up at four on LBC, it's Tom Swarbrick, but now it's time for Sheila Fogarty. And you can hear more about it right now from me, or 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 about it right now